Could I ask people to make sure they're muted, please? I think we've got some background noise coming in. Thank you. OK, we're now live. Thank you. Thank you and good morning members, officers and any members of the public who are viewing the live stream of this meeting. This is the South Cambridgeshire District Council Planning Committee. My name is Councillor Pippa Halings um, and I'm the vice chair of the committee. As the chair, Councillor John Batchelor cannot be here today. I will be chairing this meeting and I've asked Councillor Henry Batchelor to be my vice chair. Are members happy to affirm this appointment, please? Agreed. 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 Lovely. And anybody against? No, lovely. And so we'll take that by affirmation. Um, in that case, Councillor Henry Batchelor, could you please introduce yourself? Morning, everyone. Councillor Henry Batchelor covering the Linton Ward and surrounding villages. Thank you. Thank you very much. And we are supported along the top table, the virtual top table. Um, and if this moment, could everybody switch off their videos and their microphones? And we will introduce each of the members of the virtual top table and ask them to introduce themselves. So first of all, um, could I introduce Chris Carter, please? Good morning, Chair. Good morning, members. Uh, Chris Carter, Delivery Manager for Strategic Sites and supporting the committee today. Thank you. Thank you very much. And Stephen Reid. Morning, Chair and members. I'm... And Stephen Reid, our senior planning lawyer. Yes, thank you very <laughs> much. And uh, Patrick Adams, please. Good morning, my name is Patrick Adams and I'll be clocking the meetings. Thank you, I'm a very, very important person taking the minutes from today. So um, as we go through, I'll introduce the case officer as we work through the agenda. So first, just a few housekeeping announcements. Please make sure your device is fully charged and switch your cameras and microphones off as you all have kindly done, unless you're invited to do otherwise. And when you're invited to address the meeting, please make sure your microphone is switched on. And when you finish addressing the meeting, please turn off your microphone immediately. If you can speak slowly and carefully and clearly and don't talk over or interrupt anyone. This being a virtual meeting, it's really hard for people to be able to follow um, what everybody's saying if we have anybody interrupting. And please ensure that you've switched off or silenced any other devices, um, Councillor Fain, so that you don't interrupt proceedings, both um, your video and audio, please, Councillor Fain, if you could switch those off. The normal procedure at Planning Committee is to take recorded votes um, and we will be doing that today. Would anybody please like to, I'd like to propose that, would anybody like to second that we record the votes in this meeting, meeting as normal? Um, um, Councillor Toomey Hawkins, Dr Toomey Hawkins, thank you very much for seconding that. Can we take that by affirmation? Agreed. Agreed. Good, thank you very much. Agreed. Wonderful. When we move to a vote on any item where there is not clear affirmation, I will ask for a roll call to be taken. And I would ask that during that roll call, you answer only for, against or abstain. Um, during the roll call so that we can have clarity around any of the decisions being taken by committee. Um, and I will be asking each committee member by name to, to answer to that. So now committee members present, I'm going to invite each of you to introduce yourselves. So after I call your name, please turn on your video and your microphone. Just wait a couple of seconds for it to come through so everybody can see you and say your name and who you represent. Thank you very much. So. I'm Councillor Pippa Halings. I'm the member for Histon, Impington and Orchard Park, Vice Chair, but chairing this meeting. And I would like to introduce Councillor Henry Batchelor. Morning, Chairman. Councillor Henry Batchelor, member for Linton and surrounding okay. villages. Thank you. Thank you. Councillor Anna Bradnam. 
Uh, sorry, Anna Bradnam, sorry, no, Anna Bradnam I'm, is not I'm, taking part in the meeting today. She will be speaking as a local member, so I'll invite you to come when you speak as a local member. Thank you, Councillor Bradnam. Councillor Dr Martin Khan. No. Councillor Peter Fain. Good morning, Peter Fain, Shelford Ward. Thank you very much. Councillor Dr Toomey Hawkins. Good morning, everyone. I'm Toomey Hawkins and I represent Caldicott Ward. Thank you very much. Councillor Judith Rippeth. Good morning, I'm Judith and I represent Milton and Waterbeach Ward. Thank you. And Councillor Deborah Roberts. Good morning, Vice Chairman, or should we say Chairman this morning. Um, sorry, my video camera isn't working, but it's uh, Deborah Roberts, uh, District Councillor for the Boxton Ward. Thank you very much. And Councillor Heather Williams. Heather Williams, I represent the Mordens Ward. Thank you. And Councillor Dr Richard Williams. Thank you, Chair. I'm Richard Williams. I'm the member for Whittlesford, Triplo, Heathfield and Newton. Thank you. And Councillor Nick Wright. I am substituting for Nick Wright. I'm Sue Ellington and I represent Swavesea Ward. Thank you. And do we have a substitute as well for Councillor Anna Bradnam? Yes, Ooh. Councillor Jeff Harvey substituting for Councillor Bradnam and I'm the member for Portion Ward. Thank you very much. Are there any other councillors present? Councillor Anna Bradnam, I think you're present and you'll be addressing the meeting as local member. Yes, Chairman, I'll be uh, I'll, I'll be addressing the meeting as local member. Thank you. Thank you very much. Good. So and also just to finishing the housekeeping, if any time a member leaves the meeting, can you please make that fact known to me so that we can record it in the minutes? Um, and so for members of the public are aware if a councillor is absent for any part of the presentation or debate about an agenda item, then they may not vote on that item. Given that we're doing this virtually and there are often technological issues and technical issues, then we will um, often hold and wait for people to be able to rejoin so that doesn't disrupt the proceedings. We've got several public speakers today and I'd just like to explain how public speaking will work. This meeting is being broadcast live via the Council's website. Public speakers are reminded that by participating in this meeting, you are consenting to being broadcast and to the use of the images and sound recordings for webcast and training purposes. You'll each have three minutes to address the committee, each of the slots that are given, either individually or together with one another within those three minutes. When you start speaking, we will start the timer and please ensure you switch the microphone on before you speak. And when your time has elapsed, we'll ask you to conclude your speech. If you continue to speak after we've done so, we may mute you to enable proceedings to continue. Once you've finished speaking, we may wish to ask you some clarification questions. So please be concise in your response. And if there are no more questions, you may leave the meeting and continue to watch the meeting via the webcast. Committee members are reminded that any questions to speakers should be for clarification purposes only, and the process for this shall be as follows. I shall ask if there are any questions, and if you do have questions, please ask to speak in the chat function. This committee can only consider planning reasons for or against the application, the material planning reasons. Um, today, um, in one of the applications, we do have various members from the um, police and the constabulary services and there may be given it's a complex application quite a few clarification questions what I'm going to ask when we get to that agenda item is that you really prepare to ask those immediately after the three minutes um, public speaking um, as it would we won't be able to ask those later on in the meeting so please if you do have questions get them prepared and make sure that they're used in the clarification section 
Um, the committee cannot consider general observations about the de development site and it cannot consider comments from public speakers made outside their allotted speaking time apart from that clarification question that we said. I as chair have the ability to mute or remove participants as necessary and once the committee has heard from all speakers and planning officers we'll have the debate and form views on the application and then the planning committee will then vote. The outcome is decided by majority vote in the event of a tie, I as chair have casting vote. When planning committee members vote, please can they ensure that they identify themselves, speak into the microphone so that the vote is understood and by those watching the webcast too. And members once again remind that they should indicate whether they are for, against or abstain when their name is called. And with those housekeeping notes, we'll move now forward to the um, agenda. And agenda item two is apologies. Patrick, do we have any apologies for today? Yes, Chair, we have apologies from Councillor John Matchler, Councillor Henry Batchelor is substituting, Councillor Anna Bradman, Councillor Jeff Harvey is substituting, and Councillor Nick Wright. And we just heard that Councillor Sue Ellington is substituting. Thank you very much. And if we move to agenda item three members, which are declarations of interest. Do any members have interest to declare in relation to any of the items of business on the agenda today? Chair, can I? Sorry, I think, um, yeah, I did have one. Then I think I think it was Councillor Ripperth had one as well. Um, but my, my interest, Chair, is I'm a member of Cambridgeshire County Council who I've mentioned in the report. And I believe they also own the park and ride site, which is adjacent to the application site. Thank you. Thank you. And who was next? Sorry. I believe it's Councillor Ripith, if my ears didn't deceive me. Councillor <laughs> Ripith. Yes, it's Councillor Ripith. Um, sorry, the chat was working slowly for me. Um, just to say that I'm local member for Milton and Water Beach, as I've just mentioned, and I come to this matter afresh. Thank you very much. Anyone else? I don't think so, Vice Chair. No, Chairman, that's it. OK, thank you very much. And now we'll come to the substantive items listed on the agenda. Um, and we go to item number, well, item number four, which are minutes of the previous meeting, which we can find in pages one to six on our agenda. Do we have any comments on the minutes of the last meeting? I'll go through. Yeah, so I'll go through the pages. Uh, actually, um, Judith Ripperth just come in with a late one. Thank you. Um, hi, I will try and get that to work more quickly. Um, just to abstain because I wasn't present. Fine. I think that's it, Chair. I should probably abstain as well as I also wasn't present. So, members, can we accept the minutes of the last meeting by affirmation? Agreed. Anybody against? No, thank you very much. And so we've accepted the items on the agenda and we'll now go to the substantive item, which is agenda item five on page seven in the um, printed report pack. This is for um, application 20 stroke 04010 stroke FUL as a full application, the land southwest of Milton Park and Ride. The proposal is for one and two storey building containing offices, custody suite and associated facilities, new access, internal access roads, hard standing, car parking areas, landscaping, drainage attenuation features, lighting and means of enclosure. The applicant is the Cambridgeshire Constabulary and the key material considerations for us today, um, members, is include the principle of development as this is outside of the development framework for Milton and within the Green Belt, um, loss of agricultural land, landscape, layout, scale, appearance, biodiversity, flood risk and drainage, highway safety, management of roads and parking, residential amenity and any other matters. We have not had a site visit given the situation with um, the lockdown. It is a departure given that this is outside of the development framework and within the green belt and it's been brought to committee because the officer recommendation of approval conflicts with the recommendation of Milton Parish Council and the officer recommendation is 
to be found is approval and our decision today can be found on page 38. And the recommendation is to approve the proposal subject to a consultation with and confirmation from the Secretary of State that the application is not to be called in for his determination and b the planning conditions um, that are set out and are agreed by this committee. So that will be the decision that we will be voting on um, after our debate. The presenting officer is Lewis Tomlinson um, and Lewis, if you could now help us with your presentation of this application. Thank you, Chair. Yeah. I'll just share my screen. Could I just confirm that you can see that on your screen now? Yes, we can see your opening page on that. Yeah. Right. Thank you. So good morning members. The site in front of you today is land southwest of Milton Park and Ride as defined by the red line on the site location plan. You can also see the site location plan includes a strip of land adjacent to the A10 which includes a ditch. So the site is located outside of the development framework boundary of Milton in the open countryside and within the Cambridge Greenbelt. The area of the planned application is 3.44 hectares, what is currently arable farmland. The northern and eastern boundary site are marked by a hedgerow and the western boundary is marked by a dry ditch. To the south and the west, the remainder of a large arable field, just here. The site sits to the west of the village of Milton, so Milton is across here and is separated by the A10 trunk road, which runs along here. The site is to the northeast of the city of Cambridge, so Cambridge is down this way. To the west and northwest of the site, beyond the established tree hedge line, is Milton Landfill Waste site. The associated landfill wraps around the west and also to the south of the site, so along here. To the north is Milton Park and Rise, which is just here. And to the south is the A14, which runs along here, and it's interchanged with the A10. That's an aerial view of the site. So just to point out the key parts of the context, so you've got Milton, the village of Milton here, you've got Milton Park and Ride here, you've got Milton Recycling Centre here, the landfill wraps around here, and the site in question is in here. A14 to the south, City of Cambridge to the south, and the A10 running along here. Um, that's just a further plan, just showing that context in a bit more detail. So this is the site entrance. So you've got the A10 here, entrance to the park and ride, and here is the site entrance. Again, another photo looking towards the site entrance down here. This, these are photos taken from within the site. So this is the existing tree belt to the east of the site with the A10 in the background. Um, this is looking south of the site. And as you can see, you can see the landfill in the background. Again, this is taken within the site and this is looking towards the west. So towards Milton Recycling Centre. Again, you can see the landfill in the background. Um, this is just a photo of the park and ride showing that there's CCTV within the park and rides. This is a photo for the access to the bridge across the A10 from the park and rides. Noting that there's clear signage saying cyclists to dismount and to walk their bikes across the bridge. This is a photo of the bridge across the A10. And this is a photo from the Milton side. So this is the access showing um, how to access the bridge from Milton. Again, just to point out, clear sign is saying cyclists do dismount. 
So the proposal in front of you today is for a new Cambridgeshire Southern Police Station. This application seeks approval of 5,131 square metres of floor space in a part single and part two storey building to accommodate all the functions of a modern police service, including office, technical and support areas, welfare and custody rooms. The layout of the site includes provision of access ways, parking, storage and circulation areas, for vehicles, plant areas, landscaping, external lighting and service water drainage areas. The proposed building, as I've stated, would be for a new Cambridgeshire Southern Police Station. Key elements of this proposal include so two storey office building with attached single storey custody facilities, including the provision of 24 cells. Um, <clears throat> a detached property store and a detached scene of crime office store, 304 car parking spaces, 30 cycle parking spaces, new access from A10 Milton Park and Ride and a pedestrian access into Milton Park and Ride, which also acts as an emergency vehicle access. So I'll just run through this in a bit more detail. So this is the overview of the site plan. You can see the access road coming off. Um, the access to Milton Park and Rides. I'll just zoom in so we can see some more of the key features. So just to run it through, so here you have the building. So the two storey element is this here with a single storey element attached. As mentioned, the single storey element serves the custody suites. You've got two detached buildings. One is the property store, which will be accessed by the public for um, such as stolen bicycles. Another one is the Soco storage, so that's the scene of crime officer storage. So now looking at car parking, it's split into a public area and a private area. The public area, you have 10 Vista car parking spaces here. And you have a further 10 here visiting for custody. You have past this blue line here, it comes into the private realm. So you've got the operational vehicle parking area here. Beyond this orange line again in the public realm, this is for the staff car parking. Please note you've got cycle parking here and there's also allocated space for future cycle parking if the demand increases. That would be um, through the travel plan. This purple line dictates the high security area of the site, which is around the custody suites. And this element of the car park is an overflow car park to um, enable future demand to be met. So it's worth noting for members, there's a number of strict functional considerations that have to be taken into account when designing this scheme. The proposed layout of the custody suite must strictly follow the home office design guidance, which states that all custody suites must be on the ground floor. Um, the proposed scale of the building has been reduced down to its core needs um, in accordance with comments received from landscape and design officers, which are both now satisfied with the proposals. So I'll just go through the plans in a bit more detail. So this is the proposed ground floor plan. So the public realm entrance is this element here, and I'll point that out on the elevations. So we've got projecting bay, so it's clear legible entrance to the site. You've got office accommodation for the different functions of the police force and you can see here you've got the custody suites um, with the main office, uh, the main desk in the centre with fingers spreading out so there's clear um, surveillance of what's happening in the cells. So this is the proposed first floor plan. Again you can see this is a two-storey element here with the projecting gable. Looking at the proposed elevations, so just to point out, here is the access. So this is where the public will access the building with a projecting bay. Again, you can see the two storey element here and the projecting entrance here with the single storey element of the custody suites to the rear. So this is just a plan highlighting the proposed landscaping scheme. This will also be conditioned in consultation with the landscape officer. Um, in So the scheme proposes to retain the existing tree belts that's just outside the site boundary 
but also to establish a new tree bell around the site. This is one of the visuals of the front access. So this is the public realm area of the site. The access here. Again, just another visual. This is a plan um, just showing the extensive CCTV scheme that is part of the site, showing that all areas of the site are covered. So the key material considerations today are the principle of development, green belt, loss of agricultural land, landscape, layout, scale, appearance, biodiversity, flood risk and drainage, highway safety, management of roads and parking and residential immunity. I will touch upon some of these key material considerations, but they're all outlined in the officer report. So as, um, as stated, the site falls within the green belt. Therefore, the applicant has put forward a full business case to justify the proposed development on the site within the green belt. To summarise um, why this application has come forward, the current facilities at Parkside suffer from the following issues. There's no room to expand the station. Um, there's too few cells which then affect the frontline service. For example, when cells at Parkside are full, officers have to often transport people they arrest 40 miles to Peterborough or Kins Lim. The location being a city centre location is subject to heavy traffic. Um, which not only has um, impacts on time, but also detracts from other policing tasks due to this delay. It's also not meeting modern standards. Um, a recent review has highlighted a number of issues that cannot be overcome at Parkside, including ventilation and condition of the cells. So the operational requirements of the police force have, inf have informed the best geographical location for new facilities. These requirements are travel time from point of arrest, where arrests are happening, ease of access to the main road network, parking availability for operational vehicles and staff, and transportation links for detainee on release and staff travel to and from work. So one of the key objectives here is to minimise the detainee travel time, and as such, the search area was narrowed down to the north, northwest of Cambridge City within the triangle on the screen in front of you. A sequential civil approach was adopted to reduce the list of initially identified sites to ensure that only those that could de deliver the objectives were carried forwards. So 22 sites in total were considered. Um, sorry if you can't read that, it's the only way I could fit that on the screen. But as you can see, there's 22 sites there with various comments on why um, these couldn't be delivered. This process, um, so a number of these sites were ruled out on functional grounds and those remaining were tested for availability. This process reduced the number of possibility to just three sites, all which stand in the Cambridge Greenbelt. So if you just look at the diagram in front of you, I'm just going to go through these site by site. So these are the three sites that were within the green belt. Site A, which is down here, land west of Histon Road in south of the A14. This is within the inner green belt area. Um, and this, con this area contributes to prevention of sprawl and a limited contribution to the keratin setting of the city. So it was ruled out on those grounds. Site C, which is just up here. That is land north of Butt Lane, has a strong affinity with a flat and open agricultural character, the Greenbelt, north of Cambridge, so was ruled out. Site B, which is the site in front of you today, recognises being of relatively low value in the Greenbelt terms because of the impact of the adjoining uses, such as the raised area of landfill and its associated tree belt, the waste recycling facility and the park and ride site. Should mention here that the landscape officer has assessed the application, looked through the submitted landscape visual impact assessment, supports the application as a, and has confirmed that development would have a limited effect on the rural carrot and openness of the green belt in compliance with local and national policy. This is one of the key views from the A10, and you can see the site is just here in red. 
and would sit behind this tree belt that currently sits along here. So officers considered that the applicant has demonstrated very special circumstances in accordance with the requirements of the MPPF. The conflict with local policy is outweighed by the public benefits arising from the proposal, which include improved police service for the surrounding communities of Cambridgeshire. So just going through now some of the main issues on the application. So flood risk and drainage. Concerns have been raised by Milton Parish Council and local ward members regarding drainage. The applicant amended the scheme to address this through the inclusion of a new ditch that run parallel to the A10 to ensure adequate connection to the 13th public drain, which is an awarded water course. So this is the new drain along here included within the red line. Both the lead local flood authority and the drainage officer support scheme and officers accept this advice. Parking. So the proposed amount of car parking is 304 spaces. The applicant has provided a robust case for this amount of car parking that takes into account shift patterns, operational vehicles and the future demands. The scheme will also provide 30 cycle parking spaces and the applicant's travel plan aims to reduce the number of staff commuting to and from the proposed development site by single occupancy car. Um, traffic has always um, has also been assessed, so transport assessment has been submitted with the application in consultation with the highway team at Cambridgeshire County Council and both the local highway authority and the transport assessment team support the proposal in terms of traffic impact and highway safety. I should point out that there are representation, um, representatives from the local highway authority at the planning committee today if members need to ask questions. Um, in terms of biodiversity, so the ecological impact assessment that was submitted with the application has found minimal ecological constraints as it's mainly arable habitats. The ecology officer has been consulted and supports the application subject to conditions to ensure that biodiversity net gain is achieved on the site. So one of the main issues around the application is the fear of crime. So Milton Parish Council and residents have raised concerns about the fear of crime. Um, to quote, the surrounding area is poorly lit. There is a potential for increased antisocial behaviour, including drug dealing in Butt Lane, Colston Lane, area similar to that currently exper experienced in the Parkside area, which could discourage pedestrian cycling activity. So the existing police station at Parkside in the centre of Cambridge and the proposed station on the outskirts of Milton not equally comparable due to the differences in context. No evidence has been provided either to um, evidence the claims of drug dealing near Parkside police station nor that is di caused directly by the presence of Parkside police station. No evidence has been submitted to demonstrate new police station will also attract such behaviour. The fear of crime is also centred around the release of people from custody into Milton, particularly after public transport stopped running and these concerns are understandable. These supporting documents um, set out that all detainees that are released from police custody are subject to a risk assessment prior to, re prior to release. The proposed police station would operate 24 hours a day resulting in more movements to and from the site at times where the park and ride is currently very quiet. This would introduce a level of surveillance that does not exist at present. It is expected that police presence in the local area should act as a deterrent for crime. If any crimes were committed, then that would be a police matter for investigation. The Parish Council um, consultation re response all also requests CCTV on the A10 bridge which should be monitored 24-7 to evaluate any need for further enhancements, prove surveillance at, at the park and ride and other items beneficial to Milton residents. So just to highlight to members, this is the bridge across the A10. The site in question we're looking at is just off the screen here and um, pedestrians would travel along the park and ride in across the bridge into Milton if they were travelling to Cambridge. That's just a photo of the A10 bridge, just to remind members. So um, 
when assessing a contribution, it must be assessed against the free statutory tests, the SIL regs. Um, <clears throat> officers considered that the CCTV coverage is not necessary to make the development acceptable in planning terms and therefore fails to satisfy part A of the SIL tests. Concerns have also been raised about the safety of the ATM bridge. Officers have consulted local highway authority regarding this matter and they have advised the following. The highway and its associated infrastructure is designed in accordance with clear safety and design standards. Um, I would not take into account there are dangers present to anyone wishing to behave in an actively unsafe way. The local highway authority has considered the existing pedestrian bridge from a highway perspective and does not have a reasonable basis to secure design modifications based on the predicted pedestrian flows. The bridge also meets safety and design standards and the structure of the bridge means that it's not possible to simply fit higher parapets. Concerns regarding the use of the bridge by vulnerable people would ultimately come down to how the police manage the site and manage the release of people from custody. Um, as Chair highlighted, there are a number of people from the police force present today that will be able to answer questions for members. Um, please note all consultees support the application in front of you today. So the recommendation is to approve the proposal subject to consultation with and confirmation from the Secretary of State that the application is not to be called in for his determination and the planning conditions as set out in the report. Thank you, Chair. Thank you very much, um, Lewis. Um, Councillor Martin Khan, I noticed that you've joined the meeting. If you just want to um, introduce yourself and yes, having missed part of this, it would mean that you'd be able to join in the debate um, and any of the questions, but not vote on this. I think that that would be clear. Uh, OK, uh, I'm Councillor Martin Khan, uh, Councillor Histon and Impington. Thank you very much. If you could turn off your video and audio, Councillor Khan, thank you very much. Um, and now we have the chance members to ask any clarification questions of the case officer of Lewis has done a very thorough job of presenting a summary of this complex um, case and also addressed many of the concerns that were raised as well. Um, do we have any clarification questions, please, Vice Chair? Not as of yet, Chair. I'll give it a few seconds in case any appear. We have first up is Councillor Sue Ellington. Thank you, Councillor Ellington. Thank you, Chair. I just wanted to clarify the um, landfill site is all around this, but historically was this ever landfill? Thank you. Lewis. Through you, Chair. Um, so this land has previously been used as farmland. Shall I just share my screen? Just shows an aerial view in front of you. So just bear with me. I, I'm assuming that the question is around contamination. Is that right, Councillor Ellington? Potential. It's about contamination. It's also about um, structure of the building in order to ensure you don't get subsidence and stuff. Thank you. Um, so in front of you is just the aerial view of the site. So this site is farmland and hasn't been used as landfill. The landfill stretches around the site. Um, the contamination team at the council have been consulted have not raised any concerns either. Thank you, and, Chair. And thank you. And in terms of the conditions, is there something around the, the piling, I think, of that as well? There is. There's also an unexpected contamination condition recommended as well. Thank you. Is that does that satisfy you, Councillor Ellington? Yes, thank you. Thank you very much. Any other questions? We have Councillor Hawkins, Chair. Councillor Dr. Toomey Hawkins, please. Uh, thank you, Chair. And through you, uh, one I hope is a simple one. Uh, paragraph 89 on page 27. Uh, refers to a scheme including external lighting. Um, I'm just concerned about light pollution into the houses across the road in Milton. 
I don't know how high those uh, external lighting columns or whatever it is might be. We could just have some clarification on that, please. And um, the second thing is on page 34, paragraph 131. Um, the, I'd like some explanation on how the, those remanded in custody are released. Um, there's an example given as in the case of Fopwood and Parkside just a bit more clarity on how that will happen so that we know, at least we can understand um, how the mitigation against the fear of crime is proposed. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Tommy Hawkins. It may be that's a question also for the constabulary, but we can we can ask Lewis. And I understand also, Lewis, we do have a condition 12 around obtrusive lighting. Could you give a bit more clarification on that to answer Dr. Hawkins' question? For you, Chair. So. In regards to lighting, that's been assessed by um, multiple consultees. So we've got the ecology officer who's looked at it for impact upon the environment. We've got environmental health. We've also looked at the impact of the lighting scheme. Both consider it to be acceptable and it's conditioned to ensure that the scheme put forward will be followed. In regards to the release of custody, it might be better to leave that question to the police and just tackle that in one go, but I'm happy to answer it now if need be. I, I think if that's OK with you, Councillor Dr Tommy Hawkins, if you save that question for the constabulary who, who are here and could help us in terms of their policy around that. That's fine. Thank you. I didn't want to miss it. <laughs> yeah, no, absolutely. Good. Uh, next is myself, Chairman, then Councillor Harvey. Thank you. So my question, um, Lewis, is regarding the parking. Um, is You mentioned in your presentation that there was an overflow car park for future demand. Is the expectation that will be an overflow for staff or for public members? Because I appreciate there's, uh, you know, 10 parking spaces for the public is quite few at the moment. Um, and a similar question, uh, obviously the park and ride site is next door with an a new access route between the two sites. Is the, is the expectation that people would park or get the bus or drive or um, cycle, sorry, to the park and ride? park there if the car park is full and then walk over to the police station. Thank you, Liz. Thank you, Chair, for you. So I'll just share my screen again just to show the site plan. So the overflow car park is just at the bottom here, and that's an overflow car park for staff car parking. Um, there'll be extensive recruitment happening before, present and after construction of the station if approved. So this is just to ensure that the site can accommodate any future growth and does not rely on the park and ride to accommodate this future parking needs. In regards to um, public visiting the site, so there are 10 visitor parking spaces here and a further 10 here. Um, most people attending the site will be by appointment only. However, there is the park and ride to north of the site, which uh, members of the public can use, and they can also use sustainable modes of transport, such as the bus service as well. Same with the staff, they can also use the park and ride to travel to the site. Thank, Thank you, Chair. Does that answer your question? Yeah, that's clear. Thank you. And Councillor Jeff Harvey, please. Yes, thank you, Chair. Yes, uh, again, on the subject of parking um, and cognizant of the fact that I think police vehicles particularly don't have a very long service life before they have to be replaced and the um, ceasing of manufacture of um, internal combustion engine uh, cars by 2030. Um, and I noticed um, in, in the application, there doesn't seem to be any mention of electric vehicle charging provision. And, and I apologise if it is hidden in there. It's quite a long um, sort of pack of documents. But um, and then following on from that, I noticed in the energy statement to sustainability report, um, it seemed rather surprising and disappointing that such a large area of flat roof has is probably only about, uh, as far as I could calculate, only 10% of it used for photovoltaics. And therefore, if you put those two things together, um, the lack of on-site uh, renewable energy generation could constitute a sort of ongoing um, significant 
uh, either you could view it as an, a significant cost for the police force or, or a lack of a, a potential saving there. So, um, and ditto, of course, um, the large car parking area could have provision for solar canopies to increase that uh, renewable generation capacity. Um, so I just wondered what your comments are on that. Thank you, Lewis. Was there any review of, of those options? Thank you, Chair, for you. So electric vehicle parking hasn't been um, recommended by environmental health officers. Um, however, if members feel that a condition is necessary, one could be attached. Um, in relation to sustainability um, features of the site, so the applicant has submitted a sustainability and energy statement, BRIAM pre-assessment and also an output document which has been assessed by our sustainability officer. Um, the sustainability officer confirms that um, subject to conditions regarding 10% carbon reduction from renewables, BRIAM design stage and post-construction stage certificates then they can support the application that is in compliance with local plan policies. So um, as the officer, I've accepted that advice from the sustainability officer who's looked through this in detail. Thank, Thank you, Chair. You. Thank you very much. Um, Councillor Harvey, does that answer your question? Yes, it does. Thank you, Chair. Thank you. Uh, Councillor Judith Rippeth, I think I heard was next. Thank you, Chair. Um, Lewis, another question. Thank you so much for your comments on the um, safety of the bridge. Um, perhaps this question is best for the highways officers, actually. Um, when was the risk assessment last carried out on the bridge over the A10? Lewis? Um, for you, Chair, I think this would be a good opportunity to bring in Tam Parry from the Transport Assessment Team um, from Cambridgeshire County Council. Tam, are you able to answer this question, please? Thank you. Yes, uh, good morning, Chair, and good morning, Lewis, and um, I'll do my best. Um, yes, yeah, so the, the bridge would have been designed at the time of its construction for pedestrians. It's not a cycle bridge as such. And so the parapet height is, is determined by the requirement for the bridge to, to, to cater for pedestrians and, um, and therefore that would have been the assessment done in the design and, and construction of the bridge. Um, following um, the bridge's completion, then that's that's infrastructure, that's, that's there. So I, I don't expect any other risk assessment would have been undertaken unless design standards have changed. And I'm not aware that design standards have, have changed for parapet heights. Councillor Rippers. Chair, can I ask for supplementary? Yes. Um, when was the bridge completed? And I do also understand that the cyclist dismount sign is advisory. So the bridge, I would guess, was completed in the 70s, but I don't know the construction date, I'm afraid. Um, and and yes, the cyclist dismount sign is advisory. Um, it's not possible to force cyclists to, to, to obey to a sign. OK, so we're assuming the bridge is designed in the 1970s, possibly, and nothing has been changed with it since. It doesn't appear so because of the reasons that that would have been would have been designed at the time for its purpose, which is a, a pedestrian bridge and not a cycle bridge. Yeah, if it was designed as a cycle bridge, then it would have been designed to be wider without the 90 degree turns yeah. and and also with higher parapets. Mm -hmm. Thank, Thank you. you very much. Okay. Thank you very much. Um, Vice Chair, do we have any more speakers? Martin Kahn, Chair. Councillor Martin Kahn, please. Um, you have here basically a, a proposal for an, uh, an urban development in an area where there has been previous urban development. There's uh, already the uh, park and ride and, and the um, the refuse disposal area, um, so that it's basically a, a, a whole a considerable area of uh, what appears to be keeping develop, uh, urban development from being built. I'm wondering about the long term, uh, what protection we have to uh, ensure the future, uh, how, how would I describe it, the renewal of the area surrounding it uh, and future planned use in the area environment to ensure that the area doesn't become just a, an area of urban uh, urban development rather than green belt uh, area separating settlements. Thank you, Lewis. 
Thank you, Chair, and for you. So um, this has also been raised by Milton Parish Council and Cambridge Past, Present and Future about concerns that approval of this application could set precedent for future development within the Greenbelt on adjacent sites. Um, officers do not consider this to be the case. This proposal is assessed on its own merits and the very special circumstances that have been put forward by the applicant ensures that precedent would not be set. Um, in regards to kind of future expansion of site, that's all to be accommodated within this site, such as the overspill car parking and some area highlighted uh, um, next to the custody suites if required. So the, the simple answer is it's assessed on its own merits and doesn't set precedent for future development. Thank you, Chair. Thank you. Councillor Khan, do you have a supplementary? Yes, I, I, uh, in the context of this, I'm wondering what the future plans are for the management of the adjoining areas, um, the setting of it in terms of the uh, former re refuse tip. Are there plans for restoration? Are, how is that, the area around it, planned to be managed in the future? Will there be a, a, a return to a more a lesser, uh, a more rural sort of environment um, in, in the surrounding area, or, or we um, have we got long-term plans? So I'll, I'll ask Lewis, but I understand that would be beyond the the remit of this particular application, um, Lewis. Thank you, Chair. And it's, uh, um, it's yeah. just context. Sorry. Yes, simply it's outside of the applicant's control, um, and I don't have that information in front of me today. But as with all applications in the green belt, it would have to be assessed on its own merits. We can't preempt what's going to happen in the future. OK, thank you. Do we have any more clarification questions for Lewis? Not at the moment, Chairman. OK, thank you. So we'll we'll move now to the public speakers um, session and members. This is complex and it deals with material planning considerations and, and also issues around um, fears for safety, um, which are again kind of as I say more complex. So what I would like to ask you is that if you have any concerns or doubts or clarification questions that are material to um, a planning application in this case, that you do make those questions, make use of the fact that um, we do have Cambridgeshire Constabulary here represented with um, a few of them as well. Not all of them obviously will be speaking, but after they've had their three minutes, that's the chance to ask those questions. When we get into the debate and we may then have um, discussions over this, it will be difficult to then bring in them as technical experts because then we would have to be fair and allow all public speakers to have the chance again to um, to provide some input. So please do make sure that you make absolute use of, of this particular time now, especially given this the very special circumstances that are being put forward, saying that these do balance against the harm that this application would do to the green belt. So Hearing that, I'd like to now introduce and invite our first public speaker, and that is as an objector, which is the CEO of Cambridge Past, Present and Future, James Littlewood. Good, uh, good morning, everyone. Morning, James. So you do know the procedure that you have the, the three minutes um, and we will be guidance in the chat box always saying how far you've got. Um, and I'll remind you when you get to the end of your three minutes. I hope I can do that justice. Thank you. So Cambridge Past, Present and Future strongly objects to this application. We ask that it be refused because it's inappropriate development in the Greenbelt. We disagree with the planning officer that the case for exceptional circumstances has been adequately proven. There are other alternative sites available to the constabulary, but we believe that they've been rejected on the grounds of costs. This includes locations on the research and business parks around the city, as well as purchasing and redeveloping non-Greenbelt sites. For example, in para 57 of the officer's report, the option of redevelopment within the city is ruled out because, quote, land purchase costs would be high. Para 22 of the officer's report refers to a number of alternative sites that Cambridge PPF had questioned, and it seems to us that cost was a factor in rejecting some of these. Cambridge North East on Cowley Road, an approach was made to secure a suitable site was rejected, we assume it was rejected because the financial offer was not comparable with commercial or residential uses. The Evolution Business Park in Milton Road, quote, making acquisitions unaffordable. 
Enridge Research Park, Water Beach, there is land availability, but this is earmarked for high value commercial development and approaches have been rejected. And again, we assume it was rejected because the financial offer was not good enough. Not being able to afford somewhere outside the Greenbelt does not qualify as an exceptional circumstance. And therefore, this application is contrary to planning policy. There are plenty of organisations that can't afford a prime location around Cambridge. If they submit an application to be allowed to build on Greenbelt land instead, would that be approved? No, it would not. So why isn't the same principle being applied in this case? We have a similar complaint in relation to the car parking. The specification that was used in the site search was for a large surface car park. One reason being the higher cost of building a multi-storey car park. We believe that this requirement has skewed the site search and it is also the reason that the proposal before you does not include a much smaller car parking footprint with, and the consequence more greenbelt land is required than necessary. We do have sympathy that the constabulary does not have adequate funds for a non-greenbelt location nor the funds for a multi-storey car park and we understand the public benefit that an effective police service provides but we don't believe these should be grounds for overruling planning policy nor for a giant surface car park located next to another giant surface car park. We do not also not believe that the planning authority can ensure that approving this development will not lead to further harm in the green belt. And you've just heard Lewis say that he believes that's the case. However, he's contradicted even with the own officer's report, which highlights that a lower quality landscape makes further future development more likely. The application has used the low quality of this site to justify the location and the landscape officer's uh, report also um, gives the poor landscape setting as reasons for justifying this approval. So clearly poor quality landscape leads to development. So the excessive car parking and the unsympathetic high security landscaping will cause harm to the green belt. And we don't uh, agree that that harm is acceptable. So as you know, it takes decades for trees to grow tall enough to screen buildings and CCTV columns and lighting. We all know that development attracts more development and to argue otherwise is to deny the evidence. Approving this development will result in increased pressure for further development on the Rain River site and that will be caused by the harm caused by this police station. By way of evidence, Lewis hasn't advised you that this site has been included in the call for sites for 400 houses and 5,000 square metres of commercial space. Okay, so that's the remainder of the field. Yeah. OK, thank you. So um, just to say, uh, you know, we'd be very grateful if the committee would discuss the issues that we've raised before making a decision. Thank you, Chair. Thank you very much. Um, we can invite now if there are any clarification questions for for James. There aren't any yet, Chair. Thank you very much for that, and I'm sure they will be um, included in the debate. Thank you very much, James Littlewood, for Cambridge Past, Present and Future. Um, and now I'd like to invite the applicant um, to come and speak and that will be Colin Luscombe who is the Director of Estates for the Cambridgeshire Constabulary um, who is also accompanied by one two three four five six others as I understand who are there to be able to support in terms of any clarification questions if they do come. Colin are you there? Thank you. I, I am. Um, the area commander is present. James Sutherland is actually doing the presentation for ah, us. Ah, thank you very much. Okay, thank you. James Sutherland. Good morning, Chair. Can I just check you can uh, see and hear me OK? Can see you, um, hear you perfectly. And if you'd like to introduce yourselves and you just to check that you do know you have the three minutes. Um, yep. And you're the only one speaking in the three minutes, as I understand. You're not sharing that speaking slot. No, that's correct. It's just myself. Thank you and apologies for um, getting the wrong person initially, but thank you very much and you have to start your three minutes. Thank you. Uh, well, thank you, Chair and members of the Planning Committee for the opportunity to speak to you about our proposals for the new policing station. Uh, my name is Superintendent James Sutherland. I'm the Area Commander for the Southern Division, which is delivering local policing for Cambridge, for South Cams, for East Cams and for Huntingdonshire. Our proposals respond to the changing nature of crime and policing in Cambridgeshire alongside local population and economic growth. Our current operation doesn't allow us to fully respond to today's needs. New facilities are needed to improve our response and service to the public and without them tackling crime will become increasingly difficult. 
Parkside Police Station was constructed in the 1960s. It's now beyond its functional age and the custody facilities need expanding from 12 to 24 cells to meet the demands of a growing population. Government funding for additional police officers to be recruited over the next few years will put additional pressure on the restricted space available at Parkside Police Station. The Parkside site is too small to construct a compliant custody and investigation centre, making a relocation essential in order to be able to provide a fully responsive police service in the south of the county. When cells reach capacity, detainees are currently transported to Peterborough and to Kings Lynn, which could be over 40 minutes drive each way. This reduces the availability of police officers to respond to calls uh, for service and with the growing population in and around Cambridge, this is not a sustainable position. The proposed police station will serve as a base for the neighbourhood policing teams, response policing teams, public protection, child and adult investigation units and a property store mirroring the northern facility uh, that's up in Thorpewood. Visitors to the new station will primarily be by appointment and the impact on the local community is not significant. This has been demonstrated by the transport assessments. The Milton site was selected following extensive searches by a professional land agent. The search area is determined by crime hotspots and travel distances and of the 22 identified sites, only three met the criteria of these three, all are in the green belt and are subject and the subject site located between the park and ride, the landfill and the tidy tip was considered as the least harmful to the green belt. We have undertaken an extensive uh, engagement program on this project, including a month long consultation in June 2020 on the proposals. We were pleased that 70 percent of respondents agreed that the police station was a good use of the site. Analysis of respondents from Milton also showed around 70 percent in agreement. We know that there are concerns around detainee release. Duty of care is our primary concern and when determining whether someone is the right state of mind to be released. Prior to release, therefore, detainees are subject to a full risk assessment. They, uh, and where they are classified as vulnerable, it is often the case that the person is released in the company of family, friends, appropriate adults, legal advisors or other people responsible for their ongoing welfare. Should the detainee be showing signs of distress, we also have an embedded healthcare professional who is available 24 hours a day for medical advice, triage and support while the detainee is in custody. We also work with close consultation with mental health services and with other external support services to support the detainee post-release. We're confident, therefore, that no one will be released from the hub unless they're not a risk themselves and the wider public. I believe this facility uh, will ensure we're able to provide the very best service that we can to our community for many decades to come. And I'm pleased that our team has worked so closely with the planning officer, statutory consultees who are supportive of this application. We look forward to your support in delivering this development for the benefit of residents and businesses and the people of Cambridgeshire. And I'll be very happy to answer any questions that the committee has. Thank you. Chair, you're muted at the moment. Thank you. Thank you very much for that and for keeping within the, the time. Um, so if we will now open to clarification questions, and I think the best thing would be for you, James, to indicate which of you, whether it's yourself or others that you have together with you that would be the most appropriate to answer any particular question, and then they can introduce themselves at, at that point. Um, Vice Chair, do we have any clarification questions? Yes, we have a number. The first two are councillors Roberts and Fain. Thank you. Councillor Deborah Roberts, please. Thank you very much, Chairman. Um, good morning. Um, I'm sorry, I can't get my um, camera to open this morning, so it's just going to have to be a question by my word. I've got a couple of questions to the police. Um, we just heard a presentation from past, present and future chairman, uh, which was pretty detailed and, and gave quite a lot of information um, of, of their understanding. And I'd like to understand, um, is it correct that actually this is in the main being led by cost rather than anything else that there were other sites that you could have gone for however they were seemingly out of your financial bidding ability um so I, i'd like to um to have your take on that is it correct were there others because um that would put a very different slant on the whole situation my second queries are around the public car parking 
um, and the fact that it is out at Milton. I think one of the good things about the Cambridge um, station has been that it's uh, accessible to every village, really, because most villages still have a bus, fare, bus service of some kind or people can drive and get into Cambridge. Um, and therefore, I'm a little concerned about how far out it is really away from the majority of villages and also the lack of uh, public car parking spaces. We were told in an earlier briefing that that was because it was all going to be, um, all visits would have to be by appointment, which I found appalling and alarming that a police station isn't going to be open. It's one of the things that the public really dislike about the police stations these days, that there are so few and far between that they can literally, if they have got a serious problem, they can turn up at. So um, there's a mixture of problems there. Also, if if there was an incident involving the police station itself, which isn't out of the question, you are very near to a car park that could have thousands of cars parked in it, unattended, and something could go on for hours and hours, um, and we could have a situation where the public cannot get access to its vehicles and cannot get home. So I've got a lot of real queries and concerns about this application and I need some reassurance. Thank you, Chairman. Thank you. And before we go on, could I ask um, Don Wildman and Councillor Martin Khan to take off their video and make sure the microphone's off until they're requested to speak when they come to the public speaking, please. Thank you. Um, yes, so there are a series of, of questions there. So, uh, Chair, what I'll do is, um, I'm going to address kind of all the operational uh, policing questions and I'll let my colleague uh, Colin Lusk and my head of estates uh, deal with kind of more of the planning uh, and kind of logistical questions. A couple of those I think kind of broached broach both. So I'll, I'll probably deal with question two and three uh, first and then I'll hand over to my colleague, my colleague Colin uh, to address the first question. So in relation to uh, to the parking situation and police stations uh, uh, sort of being open by, by appointment, a couple of things to say on that. The we are still going to be retaining a full time um, seven day a week city centre police station in Cambridge. Uh, the chief constable has uh, has given that undertaking, and we are quite far advanced. Uh, in our uh, in our plans to find a new location. So there will still be the facility for members of the public to come into Cambridge and to walk into an inquiry office with exactly the same uh, hours and terms that we have right now and to speak to a police officer um, directly. That is not going to change. And our city centre neighbourhood team will be based there as well. So there is still going to be that policing presence and that offering of an inquiry office within the new station. So that should not, uh, sorry, within our new station in the city. So that facility for the people out in the villages should still be there. And um, in relation to the Milton site and why it's appointment only. So increasingly, um, public do not choose to contact us uh, by coming in uh, to inquiry offices. Uh, the footfall into our inquiry offices has been uh, falling uh, year on year as there are increasing more options available for people either to contact us by telephone or now uh, online uh, communication and our online chat function and online reporting uh, is sort of a sizable part of how people uh, get in touch with us and we only expect that to continue. We of course will always have occasion where we need to speak to people in order to be able to, uh, to take statements from them, to have them view evidence. Uh, any number of reasons and that's why we have an appointment system but it's not our intention to replicate the inquiry office function in the new station for walk-ins for people without an appointment because we're still going to have that facility in the middle of Cambridge. In relation to the third question which was around the potential for a serious incident uh, within the police station impacting upon the park and ride and essentially stopping people from having access to their cars for for a continued period of time i think was the was the concern if i if i understood it correctly um i of course can't entirely rule that out uh, uh as a risk um completely but i can say that in my 
t nearly 20 years operational experience, the vast majority of it based in the south of the county. I cannot recall such an incident at Parkside that impacted upon the local community in that way. So approximately the same distance from where we are um, uh, in Parkside to where we will be to the park and ride, you have a very large multi-storey car park. So the same situation could be argued to exist. And obviously there is, it's a very dense uh, population around us. There have been occasions where we've had to evacuate the police station uh, because of fire issues, firearms, that type of thing. Um, and it's not inconceivable that there would be a security issue that would have caused to evacuate it. But those circumstances would be absolutely exceptional absolutely exceptional and as i say i i cannot recall of an incident in recent operational memory where anything uh, of that nature has occurred in parkside that's impacted upon our neighbors or the wider community can i just say there though that um we so, have with that incident sorry, but through the chair i think um, sorry to the chairman to you sorry yeah and and can we just have the response to the other parts of your question first Councillor Roberts and then we can come back to Sorry, apologies chairman yes thank you so um, uh, chair if you're if you're content I'll hand over to my colleague uh, Colin Luscombe if that's uh, acceptable so I understand Colin you're the director of estates at the Cambridgeshire Constabulary is that right that that's correct thank you uh yes the, the issue of costs we we had a um uh, a very extensive valuation criteria um, some of those covered in, in the report, but uh, site availability was uh, key to that. Obviously, we can't force people to sell to us, so that was um, uh, very clear that we had to uh, have a site that was available. Um, the development and title issues were looked at, um, the timescales for any land coming forward, covenants on the land, land use, configuration, access to roadworks, co-location options, um, ICT issues and connectivity and neighbourhood compact compatibility were all there. Uh, cost wasn't, um, so the sites weren't excluded on on cost grounds. So, um, so just to be clear about that, it wasn't um, uh, it wasn't us uh, just looking at cheap land options. Uh, it was a very clear criteria uh, process in terms of um, getting down to those uh, three sites that uh, was suitable operational, operationally. Chair, I, I wonder if I could add to what Colin has just said. Um, uh, I'm um, Paul Rowland, can, can you hear me? Yes, yes I'm, Paul I'm Paul Rowland from Savills. I was offering the planning consultancy service to the uh, constabulary. Uh, and I think it might be unfortunate in some of the responses that we reported on the availability of, or non-availability of sites in the vicinity, um, where uh, James Littlewood has, has picked up on references to high value, um, high value land, high value development opportunities. This is, as, as Colin just suggested, it's something of a seller's market. Um, if, if people have land that is capable of being developed for a business park, then they will want to make sure that everything, every piece of land they sell furthers the objective of the high value business park. And it wasn't so much that we could, that our client couldn't afford to offer the same price, rather that the owners of the land were not um, happy to have uh, a, 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 the police station activities, you know, a detention centre uh, and staff car parking in what they are seeking to invest in long term as high profile business parks, if that's helpful. Thank you. Uh, Councillor Deborah Ops, did you have a supplementary? Yeah, yes, Chairman, thank you very much. And again, apologies for jumping in earlier. Too damn keen I am. Um, yeah, I am concerned about, about this um, parking situation. Um, first of all, I would also say that, you know, the reason that people don't go to police stations nowadays to report is because they're closed. Um, it's as simple as that. That's not, um, that's not of our doing. It's not that we didn't want to go into police stations to find a bobby. Um, it's that they're close to us um, and I think you know it's um, really not good enough but the second thing about the car parking is I'm really concerned we've seen protesters in Cambridge of late um, holding up um, Cambridge for days not just for hours for days and I would have thought that having a almost shared entrance to a police um, the major police station next to a public car park with thousands of cars in it would be 
an absolute dream to some members of society to go and block that, you would cause so much aggravation, which of course is the name of the game. So um, I think it's been a little bit blasé to say, well, 20 years, it's never happened. We're living in a very different world from 20 years ago, and it could very well easily happen. Thank you, Councillor Roberts. Of course, Superintendent James, you can, you've can. you answered it, and I don't think this, it's a question that comes back sort of wondering whether there could be one of these exceptional um, events that you mentioned. Um, but unless you've got anything else to add to your um, response, then we can go on to another question, I think. It's up to you, um, James. Would you like to respond any further? Um, obviously, it's um, the, the difficulty of policing is that we, we're always dealing to an extent with the unknown. Um, and like I said, it's difficult for me to rule out anything. And I certainly can't rule out that, that a group in the future uh, would consider protesting outside the police station um, or attempting to, to blockade it. I would say two things. Firstly, that that's not a tactic that we've ever seen. Um, certainly not locally, and I don't believe nationally. And secondly, I would be extremely confident on our uh, capacities, legal authority uh, and skills in order to be able to remove that uh, and remove that risk were it to actually happen. OK, thank you. Um, do we have more questions, Vice Chair? We do. Councillor Fain has withdrawn his. So the next two questioners are myself and Councillor Hawkins. Should I go ahead, Chair? Yes, Councillor Henry Batchelor. Thank you very much. Um, three questions, if I may. Um, first one, um, the footprint of this new proposed site, how does that compare with the current footprint of the Parkside station that it would be replacing? Um, second question, would this new police station cover the same area? And by that, I mean, sort of how far you know, away would I, you know, would I need to be arrested to come to Milton Police Station rather than any other? Um, and the third question is, obviously, there is a concern around the fear of, you know, crime, more crime being introduced to the area. Should we approve this? Um, is, is there any evidence that you as the constabulary can give us to, sort of, you know, waylay that fear locally? Because, uh, I mean, my sort of layman's view would be that having a police station in the area should reduce crime in theory. But obviously, I'm, I'm no expert. So any insight you can give there will be useful. So, Chair, if you're happy, again, I'll, I'll answer the questions two and three first because uh, they're sort of more operational and then I'll hand over to uh, to Colin for the first question. Um, so, well, actually, if I could just deal with the third question um, first, I'll take it in reverse order because um, uh, this is probably the, uh, the more detailed answer. Um, generally speaking, everything that we know around the evidence base around the deterrence of crime and the impact of visible policing suggests that police officers in an area uh, deter crime and deter, deter crime to a considerable degree, um, which is why uh, the opening or more often the closure of police stations tends to be such a hot uh, uh, topic issue with people and rightly so, because I think there is a justifiable uh, view and perception out there that a police presence makes people safer and deters crime. And that is probably the, the impact of police officers and visible policing is probably one of the best and most tested areas of, uh, of policing studies and of, and of criminological research. A police officer uh, in an area stops crime. Now, I'm not aware of any specific evidential study around the impact of a police station as opposed to police officers in an area uh, and how that impacts upon crime rates. Um, but I think it is a very reasonable uh, and not very big leap to move from uh, assuming that police officer presence uh, in an area uh, deters crime to uh, a police station in an area with a lot of police officers uh, coming in and out of it will, will also deter crime. So I would say on balance, uh, and I'm very happy to answer any kind of specific operational concerns about uh, about fears of crime, what happens to release persons, but on balance and overall, a police station in an area should reduce crime and should also make people feel safer. In relation to the second question, um, yes, essentially it will cover the same operational area as the Parkside Police Station, which we're uh, proposing it, uh, it 
uh, it replaces. So if you were arrested today and you would under normal circumstances be taken to Parkside, you would be taken to the new area. There's always sort of the occasions uh, where people are for particular, uh, they're either particularly close to uh, to the border of another uh, of another police station within our force area uh, where they might be taken there, particularly if there's if they're particularly violent or particularly problematic. But generally speaking, um, the vast majority of people who are arrested who would otherwise be taken to Parkside will be taken to the new police uh, police station. Um, I think that addresses questions two and three. I'll hand over to Colin Chair if that's OK for question. That's fine. Thank you. Uh, yeah, these site areas. So Parkside is 1.25 acres and the site at Milton is eight acres. Um, early on um, in the journey um, of, of uh, the custody, we did look at what we could do on site and under current Home Office design guide, it is not possible to um, construct even the 12 cells that we've got on the 1.25 acres. So the design guides now having everything on the ground floor um, and, and the Pacific uh, support functions that are needed and um, areas of visibility from the um, from from the cell desks are such that uh, the current site um, cannot support any form of um, any form of custody. Um, so so hence it was needed to to move to another site. Um, operationally, we wouldn't want to move just custody because there's so many support functions that go with it and actually it is the custody that is the hungry part of the land take so um, you probably uh, remember the diagrams that uh, Lewis uh, showed the um, office accommodation at the front of the um, uh, of the block is two story uh, and the substantive land take uh, is is the custody to the rear so to answer the question, it's 1.25 at Parkside and 8 at Milton. Thank you very much. Um, we have Councillor Dr Toomey Hawkins. Uh, thank you very much, Chair. Through you, um, I really would like to pick up the question, what happens to people who are released from custody? Um, we talk about risk assessment. Um, but it then, it then says in paragraph 132, once they've left custody, however, the police have no power to enforce their chosen route home. And this, I think, is a concern of the residents and the parish council of Milton. And my second question is, how will you know, are you going to be doing a benchmarking in Milton area before completion to establish what level of crime there is and then monitor to see if there's any increased level of crime? Thank you. Thank you. Yes, James, you've got two questions there. I I do. So um, on the first question, sorry, I'm just going to kill my camera for a moment so I can continue speaking. And my device was fully charged, Chair. I promise. Uh, but I, I've now been away from the from the charger for some time. So I'm just going to kill the camera and carry on talking to you for a moment. Um, whilst I plug in. So in relation to the questions around um, the release from custody, this is probably one of the most important aspects of how we manage to detain people within custody um, and how we manage them afterwards uh, around risk assessments. So it's important to note that our legal obligations to say nothing of our ethical obligations to detain people does not stop when they are released from custody. Under um, the terms of the Independent Office of Police Complaints, they will consider a death in police custody to extend to a 24 hour period after people are released from custody. So were somebody to die uh, within one of our facilities, there would of course be an independent investigation, but there would also be an investigation if somebody died 24 hours after being released. So that really does focus our custody staff, not just on keeping people safe and looking after the welfare whilst they're with us, but really making sure that when we release somebody from custody, we are as certain as we possibly can be that they will not come to any harm or that anybody else who comes into contact with them will not come to any harm. 
and an awful lot of uh, of work and research uh, into safety detention has has gone into actually making making sure that's possible. So, whilst whilst people will sometimes sadly uh, die in police custody, it is or following police custody, it is an exceptionally an exceptionally rare event. Um, and I believe that it hasn't happened within Cambridge for about eight years in circumstances which I think are quite different from some of the concerns that have been raised in the in the run up to this uh, uh, to this application. Um, but in terms of what happens to people once they've been released from custody, there is an extremely detailed risk assessment. It runs to approximately, I think, 30 questions and it considers all aspects of their physical health, of, uh, of their mental health, uh, of their family circumstances, whether they have any dependence of where they're going to go, how they're going to get there. And we have a responsibility to make sure that when we release people from custody, they get home safely. Now, it is correct that we cannot mandate somebody's particular route from how they leave custody. But generally speaking, people who release uh, who are released from custody, their first priority is they want to get home. Uh, they've just gone through whatever has sort of happened to them, however they end up in police custody, it will have been quite uh, quite a, uh, a draining experience, I suppose I would describe it. Uh, and most people want to get home uh, to where they live, to their bed, to their family as quickly as they can. And we work to uh, to make sure that they get there. Now, sometimes people are capable of leaving uh, under the under their own steam. Uh, and sometimes we will make sure that they've actually got uh, transport accommodation and that might be calling a member of their family to come and collect them. If they're, a, if they're a child or a vulnerable person, very often we'll take them home. We can facilitate travel warrants, people can use public transport, but all of these are things that we consider when releasing people. So I cannot underline enough just how much it is not a case of us opening the cell doors and turning people out on the street. Nothing could be further from uh, from the truth. The overwhelming, the primary and overwhelming priority of the custody sergeant is to ensure the welfare of detained people during and after their release from custody. And that takes precedence over every other concern, the investigation, everything. Um, a distant second from making sure uh, people uh, uh, are alive and well is, ins is ensuring that we've got uh, fidelity towards the law and, uh, and to pace. Uh, and that is the reason why the custody sergeant is an independent officer. They're independent of the investigating officer. They're independent of the arresting officer. There are really clear safeguards in law and within policy and procedure to ensure the custody sergeant has the independence to make sure that when people are released, they are safe. That obligation extends to ensuring that nobody else comes to harm uh, following the release of somebody from custody. So there is the risk assessment considers is this person likely to commit further crime or or to cause harm to any person that will factor into a decision about whether that person is remanded in police custody or not so if uh, uh, simplifying the legal situation somewhat if somebody is charged with an offense uh, following their arrest and following their detention in custody uh, one of a couple of things will happen they will either be bailed to appear at court uh, at, a, at a fixed time uh, later on, or they will be remanded in police custody and then transported by uh, uh, our, uh, our uh, contract services to the court in a secure environment. Um, and people will be remanded in police custody for a number of reasons, but a principal one is concerned that they will go on to commit further crime or cause further harm or intimidate witnesses. So the custody sergeant alone uh, is empowered to make that decision and they give very, very careful consideration to what the person has done, how they've behaved in custody and to make as objective assessment as the risk they present as possible. So we give these things very careful consideration. The other thing is that when people are released, either on bail to go to court or released under investigation or released with no further charge. They've gone through that risk assessment process and we can say with an extremely high degree of confidence that they are leaving custody facilities uh, without being in possession of drugs, without being in possession of weapons, um, that their intention is 
almost always to to get themselves home and to get themselves home as quickly as they can. Um, again, I cannot entirely discount the possibility um, that somebody will not leave custody a custody facility and commit a crime in the immediate area. What I can say, which is based on, again, nearly 20 years of, of operational policing and with an understanding of kind of the, the criminological research around uh, around deterrence of crime is that it is rare and people, particularly people who have just been released from custody, do not want to get back into custody. They are unlikely to commit crime in the immediate vicinity of the police station where they've been released, particularly now with the kind of with the risk assessment process, which I've just spoken about. So I know that these are difficult uh, areas and it's there's always an element of uncertainty so I can't give kind of the 100% guarantees which which some people like but I, I'm sure that we, that we probably understand that and that there is that this is a, a, a there are difficulties with, with some aspects of this but I would just like people to be as reassured as they possibly can be just how much thought consideration uh, and kind of professional judgment goes into the decision to release somebody from custody and then the safeguarding is put around them and the local community that and was probably two very full answers it was very full we've got but we have got the question which is around the benchmarking um because as the report has said i think councillor Tumi hawkins says if it's there's um reaction to any change in the circumstances within Milton. Therefore, you know, will there be a benchmarking exercise to set a baseline of the situation at the moment? So um, that is a that is a very interesting question. The there is a difficulty around how crime is recorded, and this is why uh, it's difficult sometimes, I think, to evaluate what the impact of a police station in a particular area on crime rates is. And the reason for that is that sometimes uh, police stations will be used as a default recording location for certain crimes. So, for example, if the location of a crime isn't known, then it might default to a police station or uh, some crime does take place within police stations. For example, if uh, if a member of the custody staff or a police officer is assaulted in a police station, that crime will be recorded there. Um, oftentimes, people will be further arrested in custody for more offences that they've uh, that they've committed, or they might be found upon uh, search of being in possession of drugs. For all these reasons, if you were just to look at a map of crime data police station might appear to be a hotspot from cr uh, for crime. Obviously, we understand that, that is not the case, that there are these are kind of the uh, some of the kind of the just the operational reality of it and how we have to ethically record crime. What I will say is that Milton is a very safe, low crime area. As the operational policing commander, I obviously want that to continue. I cannot predict with absolute certainty what the level of crime will be in Milton after the police station. Everything that I understand around policing and around uh, the deterrent effect of having police officers in the vicinity suggests that Milton is safe and will get safer as a result of this. However, if there is any particular aspect uh, around the new police station which were to cause uh, any uh, local issue within Milton around crime or antisocial behaviour, we would of course absolutely address that with our neighbourhood policing teams and problem solving uh, teams and we would get a grip of that problem because we want to be good neighbours to the people in Milton. I think the question was, Councillor Dr Tumi Hogg, is you know, would there be some kind of baseline? Um, that, that was the question, so not yet answered I would say. Okay, so it would not be specifically on that. It would not be uh, problematic for me to baseline the level of crime at the moment, and it would not be difficult for me to measure the level of crime afterwards. There would have to be some detail uh, around so the analysis of those numbers, reflecting the difficulties I've just I've just explained. But I think that there would be no issue with the constabulary undertaking that and. If that did reveal any particular problems around crime in Milton, then of course we would absolutely uh, grip it from an operational perspective. But I absolutely do not anticipate that there would be. Councillor Dr. Timmy Hawkins. Yes, I think if I could be really succinct, yes, Chair. 
thank you, thank you very much. Through you, Chair, I, I would love for you to be able to do that, please. Um, and I do take your point that, you know, uh, police in an area should deter crime. That's what I would expect. Um, but it's interesting, so, you know, to, to hear the, the full response that you've given. Um, so thank you very much for that. And Chair, thank you. I will leave it at that. Thank you very much. Um, next question, Vice Chair. It's Councillor Richard Williams. Councillor Dr Richard Williams. Thank, thank you very much. Uh, actually, most, most of my questions were, were, were answered in, in the last session, but um, I'll just stick to two small points, um, just to further clarification on then, if I may, um, just to Commander Sutherland. Um, firstly, just, just a question about the, the risk assessment and the time limit, because I, I, I mean, I assume, I mean, obviously, I'm, 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 you know, I, I take on board what you say about the, the assessments that you do, but if you reach the end of the 24 hour limit, it, it, it's kind of charge or release. So, so I, I would assume at that point, you've got to let people go um and my other point um so i just just clarify that and my other point was um you mentioned in the previous answer that that you might have a travel plan and sometimes the the, the police will will take somebody back to you know their place of you know, safety if they think they're vulnerable i mean i know i appreciate it's difficult for you to give a precise answer to this so a general answer is fine but how often does does that happen that the police would take somebody back to to, 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 um, to their home. Thank you. OK, um, so on the first question, so technically uh, the answer to that is sometimes um, the generally speaking, the Police and Criminal Evidence Act, which governs kind of all the uh, provides all the statute legislation around around custody, requires us to release people after 24 hours from which they've been uh, uh, been arrested. Um, so all of the procedure I've talked about, the risk assessment and so forth, will happen before that 24 hour mark. That is not always the case. And there are uh, occasions where uh, the people's uh, time in custody can be uh, extended before they're charged. And that's either by way of an extension to a superintendent. So it's something I have to do with, with some regularity myself, or if uh, a further uh, period of detention is required on application to the magistrates. But in any case, at some at a certain point, usually within 24 hours, um, almost always within 72 hours and in exceptional circumstances beyond that, for some very particular legal reasons, which I shan't get into, but I could if you if you wanted. But at a certain point, everybody gets released. So everybody goes through uh, through that risk assessment process and we have to sort of be flexible and sort of bespoke to to managing the risk that people present. Um, it would be extraordinary for the custody sergeant to be releasing somebody uh, who they thought was going to immediately cause uh, cause crime uh, or, or cause further harm. Um, but were that exceptional case to be there, we would respond to it operationally. There, we simply wouldn't stand back, wait, uh, wait in the offices, and wait for them to go and do something else. Um, I think we would be quite close behind them to deter that and to immediately intervene if we genuinely thought that was a risk. But again, Thank these you. are these are almost stretching into the hypothetical because I can't recall a time where that's where that's happened. Um, in relation to the question around uh, how often do we take people home, I can't quantify it. Um, and I, I would be hazard to, to, to put any sort of guess in terms of proportion because I genuinely don't know. I can say it happens with some regularity, um, but I, I'm not confident in my ability to kind of predict. I don't want to give a false impression. It will happen. It would not be a, a, a rare event. I can't say it will happen daily. And it will often be kind of a last resort because we want our police officers out catching criminals and uh, and dealing with crime, not ferrying people home. But if the alternatives are that we've got a vulnerable person who can't get home or a police officer takes them home, we're going to go with the latter option every single time. And particularly if that uh, if that individual uh, was uh, uh, was was a child. So. Um, it is not uncommon. I'm really afraid I can't quantify it with a number. Thank you. Dr. Yeah, Richard, that's, that's that okay? fine. Yeah, that's um, fine. Thank you. Good. Um, who's next, Vice Chair? Final two, Chairman, Councillors Harvey and Ripper. Councillor Jeff Harvey, please. 
Yes, thank you, Chair. Um, I just wanted to ask, and I'm, I'm sure um, this is all being considered and, and there's no good place to put uh, a station which would have uh, sort of unimpeded access to anywhere. But I'm just wondering, I mean, that particular part of Cambridge um, is, is sort of notoriously log jammed uh, when the science park is, you know, it's either people arriving at work in the morning or going late in the evening. Um, and I'm just wondering what would happen if there was sort of some kind of emergency in the south part of the city. Um, and I'm also thinking about, you know, the ways that you would get to an emergency. And, and I'm wondering about um, uh, Horning, Horning Sea Road, the B1047, which, which would be the other obvious way to go and, and, and how safe that would be, um, given it's, it's quite a sort of popular cycle route. Uh, some of that route has a cycle path, albeit I don't think all of it does. Um, you know, where, where, whether you've uh, thought, thought about those aspects or not. So I will, uh, Colin might want to come in after me because obviously there's been some quite detailed considerations around kind of the, the site placement of this vis-a-vis -vis calls of service. But just from an operational perspective, you're quite right, councillor, wherever, wherever we place ourselves in the county, we will, there will be some advantages in terms of travelling distance to, to, to some emergencies and some rather than others. We've tried to pick a site which reflects our calls of service and puts us in the best place to be able to to respond to them. But in relation to the actual site of Milton versus where we are at the moment, we are in one of the most congested, uh, uh, difficult sort of to access uh, from a from a vehicle perspective parts of the county uh, where we are in Parkside. Um, Parkside is not where you would choose to have police officers having to leave the station in cars at speed uh, on, on emergency response conditions. Everybody is familiar with, with what the roads are around Parkside are like. I'm, I'm sure I don't have to detail that, but the, the kind of the experience of being a, a police response driver in Cambridge you are surrounded by cyclists uh, and you are looking um, you know, almost with a sixth sense of cyclists because they're, they're everywhere. And driving on blue lights in Cambridge is a, is a really almost unique proposition. Can, can um, we keep so, it the application site? Uh, just, yeah. just time. So, the, so in relation to what you said in relation to uh, concerns around cyclists in the area, the police officers who will be who will be at Milton will be have more comfort and more awareness of, of the cyclists around them and of cycling safety than probably any other police officers. Um, and they are trained to an extraordinary high and demanding degree to make sure that they can uh, they can drive safely and drive uh, drive on response conditions quickly. It's probably what I have to say. I'm not sure if Colin wants to to add anything to that, Chair. Um, yeah, I've just add a couple of points um, to that. Uh, we had an organisation called Process Evolution that did the mapping for us. They took account of the um, uh, road conditions um, at the point that we would particularly be taking people into uh, custody and, and reflecting the nighttime economy. Uh, in terms of operational um, support, uh, that would uh, more often not be done remotely, so people wouldn't be responding from Milton. They would already be out um, on their patrols. Uh, so, so the location uh, pull was more about uh, transporting um, detainees. Okay. Uh, okay, Councillor Harvey. Sorry, sorry, Chair. Could I just add something onto the end of uh, Colin's response, if that's okay? If you'd like to introduce yourself. Yes. Uh, sorry, my name is Will Fairs. I'm the principal transport uh, consultant for the scheme, and so we've been supporting this from a highways and transport perspective. Um, just to pick up on, on issues regarding uh, potential uh, queuing or capacity issues on the local road network, um, that has been assessed fully as part of the transport assessment and in consultation with uh, the, the, the Cambridgeshire County Council as well and the highways team there. Um, so we have fully assessed that um, for a future year of 2028 and assessed any queue lengths or capacity issues um, on the surrounding junctions to the site, particularly onto the A10, which was obviously uh, the main point of our of our of our um, assessments. Um, all of those junctions are, are are due to operate well under capacity in that 2028 scenario, including all of the committed development to come forward in the future uh, associated with Water Beach and, and surrounding areas. Um, so hopefully that gives a little bit of um, reassurance with regards to the immediate vicinity and the highway network. Obviously, as touched on by by James and Colin. 
um, the the kind of the, the main pull for this for this site is is the uh, the proximity to the, to the strategic road network, in particular the A10 and the A14, in comparison to the existing um, Parkside site, to be able to access onto that strategic road network and get to areas of crime um, with, with in a greater time um, is 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 the reason the, one of the main reasons for the for the location of the of the police station. Councillor Harvey, does that answer your question? Yes, if I, I could just squeeze in a, a, a further question. Um, would would it be intention to have some control of the traffic lights out of the site so that you know if there, there was a sort of rapid exit of several police cars would 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 be able to hold the traffic lights to get that right turn safely uh yeah so just picking up on that point as well um we've we've had on-site meetings with highways um with regards to the access arrangements and they've also been part of a, a stage one road safety audit which is required at this at this planning stage and the access was found to be safe as um as Colin highlights, it's quite a rare occurrence or a very rare occurrence that um, police vehicles will actually leave on a blue light. They're more likely to respond to crime whilst they're out on the, in the wider area anyway. Um, but we have actually included within our access arrangements a, a keep clear hatching to allow um, if there are any queuing, which our, our modelling finds to be to be very rare, um, that those police vehicles can um, exit the site effectively um, through, through that through that system. Thank you. Thank you very much. And Councillor Judith Rippers, please. Thank you, Chair. Um, my question is regarding noise pollution. And I gather from the report that you rarely have to go out of the police station on blue lights. Um, my concern is for residents um, at night time when you do have to go out in the emergency with blue lights. Do you at night, I understand, rarely use the sirens because the blue lights are more visible and how often roughly would you say you, you have to do that? So again difficult to quantify um, in, in terms of numbers. Um, what I will say is that the the use of the emergency equipment so the blue lights, uh, the sirens principally, um, depends very much on the circumstance but what we don't have, let me give you uh, just uh, the current sort of example of our police stations. Uh, Histon Police Station is in is in a very quiet village. There's a lot of flats and, and residents who overlook our, our current um, uh, uh, station car park uh, park side. They would get very angry very quickly if the police officers uh, immediately put on sirens as they was leaving police stations. It's just not necessary. They can get a distance before they actually activate that emergency equipment. And as somebody whose office overlooks the car park, I'd be getting quite fed up with it rather quickly <laughs> uh, as well. Um, and it's normally something which, uh, which uh, a new probation officer does once and then gets a little bit of feedback on it. So it is not an automatic when there is actually nothing within uh, within the road traffic law are exemptions that require police officers to put on emergency equipment at certain times. It is down to the training and the professions of, of the police officer. So we would do everything that we can to minimise the noise pollution um, that we have um, when we were leaving police stations or we're responding to emergency incidents and you put on a siren to make people aware that you're there and to get their attention to get them to sort of pull over and move we don't need to do that in a car park or as we leave in the car park we can mm -hmm. negotiate that that separately the lights is a little bit different and you're quite right councillor there will be occasions where we use sirens at night um, but it is not all the time um, and very often because sound travels so much further at night and because lights are so effective, that won't be necessary. There will be occasions when we are, uh, but it's difficult for me to quantify it. But it is something which almost all of our police stations are in residential areas. So this is this is not kind of a unique issue that would come up for this police station. And we as a police service are very conscious of our, our obligations to be good neighbours and to and to not sort of uh, uh, impede on, upon people's kind of peace and quiet with constant sirens unless it's absolutely necessary. I can't okay. say that there's no impact of being next to a police station or a fire station, ambulance station around hearing more sirens. There will be, but we obviously do everything we can to minimise it. Thank you for answering my question. Thank you, Councillor Person. Thank you, Commander. And um, Vice Chair, I think that's is that the end of the questions? That's right, Chair. Thank you. And just to thank you all very much um, for the, the thorough um, 
responses that you've given to all of the questions and also for your time coming here. Um, you all have a very important role to play, so it's, we do appreciate you being here and being able to answer the concerns that the public and the councillors do have. So thank you very much for that. And we'll now move on to the um, next public speaker, and that is the Chair of Milton Parish Council, Mr Don Wildman. Are you there? Hello. I think you're mute there, Don. We got you off the mute. I still can't hear you. <sighs> there, yes, there we can hear you. Oh, yeah. <sighs> Slightly technically challenged. Apologies for that. My, uh, oh, thank you so my... much. You know, it's, it's really challenging for everybody. So please yeah. just, now you're on. We can hear you. We can see you perfectly. Excellent. So you know you have the three minutes. Um, yes. That we'll go forward. So try your best. Um, but thank you very much. Yeah, and thank you, Jen, for the opportunity to, to speak. Um, and I accept the challenge of speaking slowly that you gave at the beginning, and we'll still try and finish in three minutes. Um, fortunately, I can save some of my uh, notes by fully agreeing with the presentation made by um, James Littlewood on behalf of Cambridge past, present and future. Um, I can fully agree with every point that he raised there, so I won't repeat them. Uh, but on the topic of Greenbelt, I'll just uh, add a couple of points there. And I note that the initial briefings and consultations that I was involved in uh, all occurred after the preferred site had been chosen. Uh, there's never been any sort of presentations of the uh, alternate sites, no opportunity to compare um, the suitability or conditions around it. It's been Milton all the way as far as the consultations are concerned, which is a little bit concerning. Uh, and it was interesting to hear the representative from Savills um, noting that s some sites are not available because the landowners do not want this facility in their high value business developments, perhaps for very much the same reason that Milton residents are a little bit concerned. I don't know. Um, but note that the Greenbelt assessment concludes that the Milton site is less sensitive than the others because of the proximity to the landfill site. Uh, fails to consider that the adjacent landfill mound uh, is no longer in operation apart from gas recovery and according to the original planning approval for the site would have been fully landscaped by now. Even the distant operational area that's been allowed by an extended license will close in a few years time and the police hub therefore will intrude into the wider green environment arising from the reinstatement of that landfill area which is committed in the planning conditions of the original approval for that landfill site. So um, I think the impact on the green belt around Milton has been understated significantly and does not justify the conclusion that very special circumstances have been demonstrated. So uh, please hope that council will take that point and the other sites which have less impact if they were to go ahead uh, could still be considered. Uh, we have raised the topic of drainage and certainly welcome the addition of the uh, ditch uh, connecting to the 13th public drain, but we still remain concerned. Uh, the fields in the area surrounding the drain are often saturated, frequently with large areas of standing water, and even over the Christmas period, a uh, local cemetery flooded because the 19th, sorry, the 13th drain was, was full. It was unable to cope with the high volume of rainfall. And that's the same drain that flows past the uh, police site and to which the ditch will be discharging. Uh, the development focuses on maintaining historic runoff levels. And so we believe that actually those goals should be revised to take the opportunity of betterment, especially given the Met Office guidance that extreme weather incidents will become more frequent and that will bring significant increases in rainfall above current peaks. So again please reconsider um, the status quo um, that is currently applied in the conditions um, and consider betterment where possible. And then uh, finally the sort of cycle and footwear, uh, footwear access which has been mentioned several times. Um, we note that the traffic plan includes a three meter wide shared footway and cycleway onto Butt Lane and then terminates at that footbridge. 
which is narrow, low parapets, as you've heard. Um, and of course, improvements to that footbridge are out of scope of this development, but we would repeat the request that if this development does go ahead, that it includes funding for lighting and CCTV on that footbridge, because that will improve the safety of all pedestrians and cyclists traveling that route. And uh, the land at either end of the footbridge is in public ownership, which I think was questioned in the report. Um, uh, so we would propose a solution similar to that operating on the Jane Coston cycle footbridge across the A14, which is good quality CCTV, but it's actually monitored in Huntington along with uh, others in the area. So again, the question of monitoring can be addressed, we believe, and uh, would uh, urge that uh, any permissions uh, include the requirement for that scheme to be evaluated and delivered if this should go ahead. This is absolutely essential. It's a nasty little bridge. <laughs> so, um, I miss you, you have come to the end. Complete, of the perfectly, and I was just about to thank you for the opportunity to add those comments. Many thanks. Thank you, and I did forget to ask you just to confirm that you do have um, authorization for Parish Council to represent them. Yes. Today at this meeting, yeah. meeting. Yeah, thank you very much. Um, and we'll now open to any clarifications, questions for you also in terms of managing expectations members. Um, in terms of asking for a break, what I would say is we get to the end of the public speakers, which would include the local ward member, and then we could um, have a short break if that's OK. Um, thank you, Chairman. Thank you. Any clarification questions, please, for, um, for Mr Don Wildman? Just one at the moment, Chair, Councillor Ripperth. Councillor Judith Ripperth, please. Um, through you, Chair, hello, Don. Thank you for your comments. Can I ask a a couple more things that maybe you wanted to elaborate on. Um, firstly, if CCTV were to be installed as part of the Section 1 and 6 agreement, um, an amendment to this, would that make you feel you know, happier um, with the application? Uh, secondly, do you think the, dra the ditch proposed has gone some way towards your concerns with drainage and flooding? And thirdly, if I may, um, any more detail about the landfill um, and when you think people might be able to actually access that part of Greenbelt at what time in the future? Apologies for the long list. <laughs> Interesting set of questions. I, uh, clearly, we uh, we included the comments about the bridge in uh, the original comments from Paris mm -hmm. Council, uh, and and um, repeated those uh, at the mm -hmm. moment when the it came back recently. Uh, the the drainage ditch, uh, the addition of that ditch, um, so the less reliant on suds, is indeed yeah. welcome. Uh, it is a, a lot better, uh, but. Um, yeah, the problem is only going to get worse. So uh, I think in any development, we really do need to take the opportunity to go for betterment rather than the status quo, because yeah, the status quo is causing problems already, um, and not just the immediate area, but further downstream as the flow goes towards the cam uh, through the various drains in that area. Um, Landfill site. Landfill, indeed. <laughs> yes, I, I wish I could answer that one because uh, from the original planning application, which uh, and it, which includes some wonderful pictures, uh, including grazing sheep, uh, when they were talking about the future use uh, that should be in uh, public use by now. Um, but um, the gas recovery is taking longer. That's fine. That's technology. It happens. Uh, the method of fill was changed, initially speeded up, uh, but then extended several times. So each time it comes back to council, we get the comment that, yeah, we need a bit of a bit longer time. And so it's going to take another year, two years, three years before it gets reinstated. Um, so, yeah, it's the only people who could answer that would be the people in landfill as to exactly how much more needs to be done uh, to give that public access back to that particular area. Uh, but certainly it can be improved and is for the future uh, a very important part of that green belt separation between uh, Milton, Invinson and Cambridge in the opposite direction. OK, yeah, thank you. So probably that question maybe can't be fully answered today chair okay. yeah okay yeah, unfortunately not. i do wish it, uh, the whole village wishes it could. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah thank you very much um any other questions 
Just myself, Chairman, if that's OK. Councillor Henry Batchelor. Thank you very much. Um, quick question, going back to the um, your request for CCTV to be put onto the bridge, uh, it, is it the suggestion that the parish council would then manage that CCTV? Because presumably if your your indication is for anyone else to manage it, it would require their buy in. Uh, uh, we would uh, suggest that uh, we follow a similar route to or method as that that's used on the Jane Coston Bridge. Uh, that was um, run by county, but it's actually monitored at the sort of central monitoring area in Huntington, which gives 24 by 7 coverage. OK, thank you. Thank you. And I think there are no more questions, Don. So thank you very much for that and for all your contributions today. Yep. Parish Council. Pleasure. Thank you very much. Thank you uh, very much. And now we it's also for um, local ward member to speak. Um, thank you, Don, if you turn your video off. Um, Councillor Anna Bradnam, as local ward member, I understand you'd like to speak. Thank you very much, Chairman. Uh, members, welcome. <laughs> thank you. I'm Councillor Anna Bradnam. I'm a member of Milton Parish Council, but I'm here today as the local member for Milton and Waterbeach. I'm asking the committee to agree that CCTV on the A10 footbridge is appropriate and necessary, and as described in paragraph 139 of the report, to delegate powers to officers to assess the possibility of installing CCTV on or near the A10 footbridge. In paragraph 124, I note that the transport assessment team have not supported the request for CCTV, but when the Jane Coston Bridge south of Milton over the A14 was installed, it was recognised from the outset that the risk of suicide and mugging justified installing CCTV. It was installed by the County Council Integrated Highways Management Centre and is monitored by Huntingtonshire and Cambridgeshire Shared CCTV Services Control Room. I ask members, is there a significant difference in risk between the two bridges? Milton Parish Council have not requested any other contribution from this development, but they have asked for CCTV to enable activities on the bridge to be monitored. Anyone leaving the custody suite bound for Cambridge using a route finding app on their phone is directed straight down the A10, which has a 50 mile per hour limit and no footpath. Anyone looking for a safer route to Cambridge might choose the near way to the west or cross the A10 bridge to Milton, which also has northbound buses in the, in the village. The park and ride, of course, does not really. Anyone, uh, the bridge is extremely narrow, as you've seen, with barely enough room for two pedestrians to pass each other. For a pedestrian to pass someone pushing a bike requires either one or two, one or, one or both of them to give way. The parapets are low, barely handlebar height, and below this there is a drop of some 18 feet to the road below. For anyone with a fear of heights, this bridge is not a good place to be. It would be equally be a perfect place to ambush pedestrians. The pre-release risk assessment focuses largely, I will admit, not exclusively on the risks to the detainee. Um, but as the police have said, they have no powers over the detainee once released in terms of the route they take. In paragraph 134, officers conclude that a fear of crime does not warrant refusal of the application, but in my view, it does warrant monitoring of the bridge. This is a new site in an isolated location and yet connected to Milton by that bridge. At paragraph 137, the S106 officer considers two of the three tests could be met and it only failed the third test because no costings had been submitted. In paragraph 139, members are advised that officers consider that CCTV is not necessary, but that if members decide that CCTV coverage is necessary, then officers would ask for delegated powers to investigate if it would be technically possible, whether the landowner would agree, we've heard the land is in public ownership, and whether securing this mitigation by condition or S106 would be delegated. So members, if you are minded to approve this application, I respectfully request that you do ask officers to explore these matters and de delegate the appropriate powers to them. Thank you, Chairman. Thank you very much. Um, are there any questions for clarification? None yet, Chair, but if there aren't any, sorry, they're all flooding in now. 
So, <laughs> councillors Hawkins, then Ripper. Councillor Dr. Toomey Hawkins. Uh, thank you, Chair. Through you, I think I just wanted to clarify uh, the request for CCTV. Is that based on what fear of crime or safety, um, or both? Both, really, Councillor Hawkins. Um, I'm concerned about the risks to people leaving the site, so the detainees themselves. Um, I know that the risk assessment does, uh, we've heard from um, Inspector Sutherland that it's very thorough, um, but there is, there, is, there is a possibility in my mind that people might leave the site and then be themselves put at risk going over that bridge. Um, it's extremely narrow and it's a nerve wracking bridge to cross at the best of times. Now, if somebody is released late at night, uh, I fear that there's a combination of risks, either for people being approached on that bridge or um, or indeed uh, um, approaching other people inappropriately on that bridge. So. It's certainly the, the parish's request for light and CCTV is of concern. The other, the other option is for people, the other concern is for people using that bridge who might be themselves put at risk. Thank you. Thank you. Councillor Judith Rippers. Um, just a question regarding the drainage. I'm going to ask you the same as I asked um, Don Wildman. Um, have you any concerns about it now with the additional um, ditch along the A10? Um, thank you, Councillor Ripus. Um, yes, I do have some concerns. I'm, I'm very pleased that um, following Councillor Hazel Smith's intervention that the need for that ditch on the east side of the field and onto the west of the A10 has been installed and I think that will help enormously. But I just wanted to but I think it's really important that members realise that the 13th public drain in common with a number of ditches in this very flat area it runs in two directions. Mm. From the inner corner of the landfill site it flows south southeastwards towards the A10 and that is the ditch that the new that is the location at which the new ditch will into into um, will feed into it. But from that inner corner of the landfill site, it also flows north eastwards towards Butt Lane. And um, in uh, the case officer's report, I noticed he referred to that as a dry ditch. Um, I just with respect like to correct him on that. It's not a dry ditch. It is actually the 13th public drain running in the opposite direction. And that is the drain that Mr Wildman pointed out had caused flooding at Milton Cemetery, which was further to the northeast. Um, so I am still slightly concerned uh, and I, I'm not sure and I apologise, I should have asked this before, but it seems to me it's not clear to me by what means um, the outfall from the northwestern part of the site, you'll, you'll appreciate the drainage for that, the, the suite is in two halves. There's a half that goes to the east and there's a half that goes to the west and it's not clear to me whether that will be pumped into that ditch or whether it will be just by natural drainage from the swale. So I'm, I'm still slightly concerned about drainage westward into the 13th public drain running northeastwards. Thank you. Does that answer your question, Councillor Ribbeth? I think so. And that's in the debate we can ask for yep. more okay. clarification, possibly. Good. And, and also, I'd like to ask you as well as um, Local Ward, Robert, would you like to speak now or or later, Councillor Griffiths? Um, I yeah, I can speak now before the break if everybody isn't too upset by that. <laughs> we do, Chairman. We do have another question of clarity oh, for Councillor Brennan Apologies. from Councillor Richard Williams. Thank you. Um, thank you, Vice Chair and Chair. Um, Councillor Bradham, can, can I can I just um ask you to to clarify something given your sort of local knowledge. Um, of, of the area. I mean, obviously we're dealing with a, a green belt application and, and very special circumstances, inappropriate development being harmful by, by definition um, and benefits must clearly outweigh the harm. Given the concerns that you've outlined about 
fear of crime for local residents and indeed the potential dangers to um, detainees who've been released from the police station given given the location near the road and, and um, potential difficulties getting back to um, Cambridge. I, I'd, I'd just be interested for your view as to as to whether you think that um, benefits of this could outweigh those harms with that CCTV or actually are the harms so oh, so the you know the, would the benefits not be not be outweighed given the strength of the harms and the green belt and, and local concerns? I think the harm to the green belt is significant and I support the parish council's view and the views of Cambridge past, present and future. And also the point that Councillor Khan made that this represents a further erosion of the green belt separation between Milton and Impington. Um, so my feeling is that um, it's very marginal and with all due respect, Councillor Williams, it's for you to decide whether that balance is um, achieved. I feel it's very marginal and um, I feel that the green belt is precious. Um, I'm disappointed, but I can see that the parish, the, the planning committee might feel that the benefits do outweigh the harms. But I'm not saying that I um, I agree. I think it's a great shame to lose the green belt in this location. Yeah. Sorry, can I just come back for one one quick clarification? I, I take that point, Gaston Bradham. I'm not I'm not trying to discharge my my responsibilities onto you. I promise. Um, it was just really that that, that point about the, the CCTV and, and and maybe to be more precise, the extent to which that you think would remedy the 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 harms, if you like, the concerns of of, of local people. I'm not sure I feel of it about it like that, Councillor Williams. My feeling is that if the power, if the planning committee is minded to approve this, then it's this, I feel it's really important that we have the CCTV on the bridge in the same way that we have we had we have been much reassured and it's been deemed essential to have CCTV on the Jane Coston Bridge in the same way I feel there with increased use of this bridge because after all don't forget um, a lot of people are, will be expected to um, approach you know approach the, the, the place on foot so my concern is that with increased use of that bridge in both directions we need to have monitoring to us because otherwise we cannot do the benchmarking exercise or the benchmarking exercise without the CT, CCTV will not be very informative. The CCTV will provide the extra evidence to, in, to inform, to uh, colour the benchmarking exercise that Councillor Toomey Hawkins suggested and has been accepted as necessary. Thank so, you. I, you know, my feeling is that if, if it's it going to go ahead, yeah. that the CCTV okay. is needed. Thank you. Right, thank you very much. Thank you for that. And um, We'll invite Councillor Judith Ripeth to speak as local member. Thank you. Um, I'm going to be fairly brief. Um, as everybody's already heard, and these are my concerns as well, I'd like to suggest um, in debate that we uh, put forward two amendments to the Section 106 agreement, because currently I don't really feel the agreement does much for the residents of Milton. Um, first of all, an amendment um, to provide active and monitored CCTV on the A10 bridge and in time for a wider bridge to be built to coincide with um, a decision which is made on the A10 so that, um, and its future direction, um, which would be wide enough to accommodate both cyclists and pedestrians with a higher parapet um, a ledge on the walkway, as we saw from the photo, it's completely flat. Um, so if there were a ledge that could be salted in winter, so it's not quite as treacherous. And I propose that that would coincide with any A10 future development, but a substantial contribution towards that. And that's all I have to say, because I think those are the two main points which um, I'd like to see incorporated. OK, thank you. Um, any clarification questions for Councillor Ripperth? And if not, we'll take that into the debate. And Absolutely. it's 12.15 members, so if we take um, 
a 10 minute break, if that's OK for everybody. So we're we'll back here at 12.25 then to open with the debate on these issues. Chairman, sorry, sorry to interrupt so quickly, Chairman, but I'm just thinking it's quarter past 12 now. Why don't we have a half an hour break for lunch and then start? Because otherwise we're going to have to have a, another break very shortly. Wouldn't it be best? We, we've lost the short time break anyway this morning. Should we not maybe, could I suggest we have a half an hour now and then start again and continue and get it over, you know, do the whole thing? Yeah, it, it makes sense. Um, can I take that by affirmation? Yeah, agreed. Agreed. Sense. Yes. Makes sense, Chair. Yeah, thank you, Councillor Roberts. I agree. So we're back at 12.45. Oh, Chairman, can Liam stay on with me and maybe tell me what to do to get this picture? Liam, can you um, explain to everybody what will happen in terms of the live feed as well during that time? Yeah, sure. I was just going to ask, would you like me to put up a slide? That's what I would usually do. I'm very happy to do that today. Lovely. Thank you very much. And does does everybody, so it's, it's are we live still? And yeah, we're still, we're still live. I, I will put up a, a slide in about 30 seconds. Um, and yeah, the, the feed will then be cut for half hour, uh, both audio and video. Okay, so. lovely. Thank you very much. And everybody, do ten, turn off your video.
don't we don't want to lose it but <laughs> And and Councillor Fay in yours as well, please. OK, we're now live again. Thank you. Good, thank you. I'd just like to check um, if we could that we have everybody here. Um, and so I'll do a quick roll call. And if you could just, um, as if we were in class, say present. So Councillor Henry Batchelor. Present. Councillor Anna Bradenham. Well, she, I'm present she's not on the committee, as a local member, but I'm not on the committee. Oh, sorry, I'm just going through the <laughs> brain blip. Um, Councillor Dr. Martin Khan. Uh, present. Councillor Peter Fain. Present. Dr. Tommy Tumi Hawkins. Present, Chair. Councillor Judith Ripeth. Present. Councillor Deborah Roberts. Present, Chair. Councillor Heather Williams. Present, Chairman. Uh, Councillor Sue Ellington. Present. And Councillor Jeff Harvey. Present. Lovely. Thank you very much. You, Welcome. You chair, but I'm here. It's Richard Williams. Oh, sorry. I missed you oh, off there. Councillor Dr. Richard Williams. Thank you very much. Good. Thank you, everybody. And welcome back after um, a short break. We're now entering into the session of the um, debate, having had the presentation of the application and listening to the public speakers and any clarification questions. And I just sort of want to bring us, you know, into focus. So it's our responsibility, obviously, as committee um, with a very large and complex case, which by the very nature of its location in the green belt is inappropriate development. And that's taken obviously very seriously. It's against policy um, and it's considered harmful. So what has to be done is that the application and what we've heard in terms of um, we've got in front of us in terms of the report and what we heard as well from the applicant today is the very special circumstances that are being put forward to us that are being demonstrated and that um, it's put to us that they do um, the public benefit that they provide does outweigh the harm. And those public benefits we've, you know, we hear it's in our report, um, are the provision of a fit for purpose police station appropriately located, um, operationally and fully equipped to serve police functions for the surrounding communities of Cambridgeshire. And in the public speaker session, while we're understanding those, we've also heard sort of extensive responses to concerns just amongst some of the ones that I've sort of noted mainly about that process for the the sequential process for selecting the location and the um, evidence upon which that was based, the nature of the type of pol public um, policing provision, why necessary, um, and that public benefit that it provides, the impacts of police presence in an area, hearing both from evidence and um, research that it deters crime in an area, but also hearing concerns around how it could potentially, um, in terms of perception, increase fear of crime and fear of safety, um, and especially unless certain measures are taken into consideration, that drainage, certain aspects of drainage have been addressed with the inclusion of additional ditch, but there are still certain concerns around um, flooding and drainage that have been raised, landscaping also, and access to um, landscaping areas in the green belt, and the erosion of the green belt area and um, parking and sustainability. So taking a mind to what our job now is to in a very difficult ways to assess this um, balance between harm and benefit and basing everything on the material planning considerations that we know um, are what we need to base any decision on. I'll open up now this session for debate. And if Vice Chair could let me know who would like to speak, please. Certainly, we don't have anyone yet, Chair. I'll give it a few seconds. Still nothing, Chair. And first up to bat is Councillor Fane. Thank you, Councillor Peter Fain. Somebody had to start, Chair. Uh, yes, I've listened very carefully to what's been presented on this. Uh, there are various 
subsidiary issues, as I should call them, drainage, the safety of the crossing, both of which I believe can be met by conditions. We'll have to come back to that, I fear. The key question, of course, is the green belt and the test, the very special circumstances. But before addressing that, I look at the site. This is not a site which would lead to urban sprawl between Cambridge City and Milton. It is between the admittedly former, but still very visible as such, landfill site and the park and ride. And as officers have explained, it has limited impact on the landscape. But as to the key test, the very special circumstances, I was concerned as to whether this was cost driven. I'm satisfied by the presentations, uh, both by the superintendent and by uh, the director of, uh, of estates, that that was not a factor that was not taken into account and that there are in fact no other sites available which would meet these criteria except for others which are also in the in the green belt in my view would if considered be more damaging so with that in mind i do come to the view that the very special circumstances are met in this case and that we should approve this application thank you councillor fain Uh, Vice Chair, who do we have next? Vice Chair, are you there? Sorry, I thought I was unmuted. It's Councillor Ellington, Chair. Thank you. Councillor Sue Ellington. Thank you, uh, Chair. I think I've, I've listened most carefully and my concern is very much that one would have thought that with all the developments that there are in South Cams and South Cambridgeshire, that a site which was not in the green belt could and should have been found. And I think my real concern is that this um, application sets a precedent that the authorities in inverted commas are able to get permission where others would not be able to get permission. And the um, suggestion that was made, which I to some extent go along with, that um, the cost of land in the green belt is significantly lower than that in other uh, areas that might get planning permission for either um, industrial or, or uh, uh, residential development could have played a part. And I am very concerned that um, this uh, is the perspective that the population of South Cams will see um, and feel that that in some way this has been privileged. Uh, and it's for that reason that I think I shall vote against, but I will listen carefully to the discussion. Thank you. Thank you very much, Councillor Ellington. Councillor Richard Williams is next chair. Councillor Dr Richard Williams. Um, <clears throat> thank you very much, Chair. Um, well, my starting point is 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 the same point really that you started outlining in in your comments, which is that special, very special circumstances um, will will only exist where the potential harm to the green belt by reason of inappropriateness um, and other harms is is clearly um, outweighed um, by um, the benefits. So. The very special circumstances test, which I think is, which I think we all agree is the key thing here, depends on an overall balance between the good and the bad. Now there is obviously significant harm to the green belt, as you said, this is inappropriate development under the NPPF, and by definition, it is therefore harmful. But within that, there is obvious harm to the openness of the green belt from this development, um, and I would suggest there's obvious harm. 
um, in terms of visual impact as well. We're talking about lighting fences, a, a very large, um, a large building with a with a design that that is obviously not what we necessarily expect to see in in the green belt. So there is harm to openness. There is harm in terms of um, visual impact, and and we have to give that um, significant weight. Going on to the benefits, so actually before I do that, I'll just address the point of, of, of need, which Councillor Fain you know, has quite rightly raised in terms of, of need. Um, I'm not sure for my part um, that, that need has been entirely made out, but even then I would say that need on its own is not enough to outweigh um, the harm to the green belt. You, you do need to look at this overall and, and need is just, just, just one factor for me at least. Um, so mo moving on to look at the other benefits, I mean, there is obviously a benefit to the public in having a modern um, police station um, and, and, and we've heard um, from the police the benefits that they would see um, from having this, 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 this station with, with these facilities. So, so th there clearly is um, a benefit, um, but for me the benefits are not clear cut. Um, there is the possibility of nuisance. Um, for local residents. Um, there is the fear of crime, which is a material consideration, which cut against to some extent um, the benefits um, that, that there are. Um, and I think we've also heard about the possibility um, of, of harm to those who might be released from custody, or at least the difficulties they might encounter given the nature um, of uh, the location here. Um, so at the moment, for me, um, the benefits do not clearly outweigh the harm, um, given that this is green belt. We have to attach significant weight to that. And it's a, the very special circumstances test is an extremely high bar um, to meet. And for me, I will listen to the rest of the debate, but for me at the moment, that debate, uh, that bar is, is not met. Whilst I obviously have a lot of sympathy with the police and obviously I would like the police to have you know, the best facilities possible. Um, in planning terms, it's a very high bar. And I don't think for me it's been met. Thank you. Um, who's next? Councillor Khan, next. Councillor Dr Martin Khan. Uh, I, I'm making comments, obviously I'm not allowed, to, I can't vote on this, but um, uh, and I missed a bit of the first little bit of the debate because of technical problems. Um, I, I am concerned also about the green belt. I'm concerned about the demonstration of need. Um, at least from the report, not all the alternative sites were shown, only the three, um, basically the three uh, special uh, final solution, uh, solution. I am not totally convinced that um, that are not one of the any of the alternative sites could be used uh, usable. It, the site proposed is in the green belt. It's inappropriate. It e extends uh, um, development in an area which is already affected in the green belt, uh, which one would want to constrain. Um, I need to be convinced. Uh, uh, if I were voting, I'm still not sure how I would vote. Uh, I I, um, I think, for instance, I and. Um, of the three alternative sites, uh, it is clearly the best. Uh, site A might have been suitable being closer to the urban area I and mean, with better footpath access into the town, but it would uh, eliminate a, a woodland. And I think that's something we in, agree, uh, in the Green Belt area which we, we would not want. So I can't, I do see that as the best of the three sites proposed, but uh, I, I find it difficult to feel that, um, that it that is, uh, this is the only alternative. Um, uh, um, I don't feel it's totally satisfactory uh, of the sites. Uh, 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 and uh, I really feel that um, it does tend to give, uh, uh, as Councillor Ellerton was say, uh, saying, uh, the impression that we are giving priority to uh, the authorities rather than to uh, which a private uh, applicant would not uh, necessarily have. So I, I am concerned uh, and I'm not, uh, I'm still not totally convinced what I would vote were I to have a vote. Thank you. We next have Councillor Ripeth. Um, I'd like to take up the green belt again, um, like as other people have. I mean, currently it's wrapped 
by landfill. And I wonder if there's anyone, I know it's not clarification time, with any more knowledge though on when that will be accessible, any of that site. I mean, Don Wildman from the Parish Council, obviously, no, he doesn't know for sure. Um, none of us appear to know. And um, of course, gas is still emitting from it. Um, you know, I assume that would it be a number of years because um, you couldn't have people walking on the, the landscape and say if they dropped a lit cigarette, would that cause an explosion? Um, I just wondered if there was anybody here with more technical expertise. And my second point was the amendments, but I presume we'll address them a little bit later. Um, so back to your first one, you're, what you're wanting to know and understand is what the quality of the... Yeah, and going forward, because the quality of the landfill at the moment obviously isn't high quality because of its use. But, you know, how far in the future would it be before that's accessible? So maybe we can um, take that to, to Lewis, but if, if I understand the question would be, and there's been several sort of raised, which is around feelings that the site selection process, I'm saying feelings because that's what people have said, mm -hmm. there are feelings that the site selection process hasn't been as robust as necessary. And so I think I understand your question, Councillor Ripper, is did it consider what the future would be of the landfill site rather than- Yes, not just the current situation, but you know, maybe just five years ahead. Yep. Um, I don't know. Lewis, uh, would you be able to answer that question? I think Chris Carter would like to come in, Chair. Thank you, Chris. Thank you, Chair. Yes, if I may. Um, on the landfill, um, obviously the, um, the County Council is the Waste and Minerals Planning Authority. Yeah. Uh, and unfortunately, we don't have anyone from, from that uh, team here today. But in my experience, um, landfill restoration does take a number of years uh, to be complete, principally for the reason of the release of gases, as, as you've discussed. Mm. Um, and only after that's deemed to be safe would, would public access be um, allowed again. Um, I'm afraid I can't comment on the specifics of this site because I simply don't have that information in front of me. Um, but I would imagine from experience that there will be a point of time in the future where, um, subject to um, the landowner's agreement, public access to that land may be achieved again. Um, in terms of the, there have been a few comments about um, whether or not, um, uh, to, to use Councillor Ellington's term, the authorities um, are, are getting a, a, a preferential treatment in terms of uh, the Greenbelt location. I'd like to reassure members that that, that is not the case. The, um, the Greenbelt uh, review and analysis work that's been done by the applicant is as thorough as we would expect to receive from any other applicant. And as Lewis said earlier in the meeting, uh, we have to consider this application on its individual merits. Um, and whether or not there are very special circumstances sufficient to outweigh the identified harm to the green belt um, in any particular application will turn on the specifics of that application. The, the circumstances and the, um, the very special reasons will be different depending on each application. So that is a matter as Councillor Richard Williams said for the committee to, to weigh up and, and in the planning balance. Um, so I think that was all I was so going to say for the time being. Permitted to take the future of the landfill site into our considerations or not really? So that the fact that it is it is green belt, um, it, it's green belt now and it will be green belt in the yeah. future. So that the test mm -hmm. is the same uh, in my view. OK, so even if it were decades before it could be accessed. OK. Thank you. Thank you. And the, the next speaker? Is myself. Councillor Henry Batchelor. Thank you very much. Um, so addressing the main item of Green Belt, I, mean, I tend to find my view mirroring that of Councillor Fane. I think uh, I, I have a different opinion from other councillors. I think a fairly robust uh, look at sites has been done and that this site is the best and the other competing sites were also in the Green Belt as well. However, this one that we find in front of us today probably offers the uh, sort of the, the best outcome, I suppose. Um, my, I mean, uh, so far I probably would be leaning towards supporting this application. However, I would be interested to follow up on the CCTV request that Councillor Rippeth was asking about. Um, and I did have a question for uh, one of the officers around that. I'm looking at paragraph 137 in the report, and I think Councillor Braddon did touch on this in her uh, local members' comments. 
Um, so am I right in thinking, officers, that um, that the CCTV request uh, meets points A and B or satisfies points A and B in the statutory tests for requiring this, but it doesn't satisfy C purely on the cost, purely on the fact that no costs have been put forward? Could I just get some clarity from officers on that, please? Uh, Chris Carter. Thank you, Chair. Yes, through you. Um, yes, that's correct, Councillor Bachelor. Um, having given this some additional thought um, during the lunch break and, and speaking with colleagues, um, I have a suggestion uh, for a way this could be dealt with through condition rather than Section 106 agreements. Um, if the committee uh, was minded to uh, agree such a condition, uh, if you just bear with me just a moment. Um, so that, that would be a condition along the lines of the following chair. Are you happy for me to read this out? Mm -hmm. So it would be prior to development above ground level, the applicant shall submit to and have approved in writing uh, by the local planning authority a strategy for the implementation of CCTV or equivalent monitoring and associated signage covering the A10 pedestrian bridge, including landing areas. The approved strategy shall be implemented in full prior to the first use of the buildings and maintained in perpetuity. The reason I'm suggesting uh, dealing with this by condition rather than Section 106 um, is because it gives the opportunity for the applicant to investigate with the County Council uh, how uh, such a strategy could be implemented, what the costs would be, and for that to be agreed through a Section 278 agreement rather than a Section 106 agreement. Uh, so that would be an agreement between the applicant and the County Council to undertake works on the, on the public highway. Um, and uh, yes, yeah, so that's the, the recommended condition if members did want to include such such a uh, condition. Yeah, yeah, I mean, for, for myself, I think that would be would be satisfactory because clearly before this can be implemented, we have to get the buy in of the County Council as well. So, um, I mean, I will happily, you know, have more thought on this when we come to the Council of Ripiths amendments. But um, those are the comments I wanted to make at this stage, Chair. Mm -hmm. Uh, next, we have Councillor Roberts. Yeah, and just to go back, I mean, Councillor Roberts did ask when amendments um, could come come forward, and you know there isn't a specific time they could come forward at any part of the of the debate. So, Councillor Roberts, in, do you want to mention what those amendments were? Sorry, Councillor Roberts, I just realised I hadn't answered her second question there. If that's okay. No problem. Um, I can re-mention them. Um, so the first one, as Councillor Bachelor has just covered, um, active and monitored CCTV on the A10 bridge. Mm -hmm. And I'm personally happy with the condition suggested by Chris Carter. And the second one was in, in the fullness of time, with, when we have a decision on the A10's future, so whether it's dueled online or offline, um, a new, wider, and in my opinion, safer bridge to replace the 1970s structure that is currently there. And I mentioned the other reasons for that earlier. Do you want me to repeat? Uh, I think those are okay. fine. So just, um, and I'm understanding to it, this is if minded to approve, these are the, the conditions or amendments in some way that you would like to see. So a condition, you'd be happy with that being a condition rather than S106. We can come to that later in the debate. I don't know if um, Chris Carter wants to respond on in terms of the looking into the future. You know, what can we do around that? Yeah, and I was going to ask, what, what are we able to do? Thanks. Yeah, thank you. Yeah. Thank you, Chair. Um, yeah, I think the, uh, the, the difficulty um, here is that we don't have uh, an identified project. Um, which we could link this to. It's also difficult to, to in my opinion, to justify that uh, the need for a replacement bridge arises as a result of this particular development. Um, so I think that given um, the comprehensive work that would need to be undertaken at some point in the future for the upgrading of the A10, um, this would be a matter to be resolved through that work rather than through this individual planning application. Um, there's no support for a replacement bridge from the Highway Authority. Um, they've reviewed the application and, and don't consider that's necessary for this development. So um, I think that would be difficult to achieve at this time, Councillor Ripeth. I think that's it's something that would need you, to be... You discuss Sorry. at a later date, is Indeed. what we're saying, Indeed. when we know what the A10's future is, whenever that is. Exactly. OK, that is fair enough, in my opinion. Thank you. And could I ask our, our legal advisor to take the video off, please, and audio? He's on the phone. Um, and so Councillor Deborah Roberts, please. 
Thank you very much, Chan. And um, I, I think it's been an interesting discussion, actually, and we've had lots of clarification um, on all sides, really. I'm not convinced entirely that it isn't somewhere down to um, the cost implications. I think it's, you know, it's pretty to be expected that there will be two very different types of um, expenditure, uh, whether it was just this field in the green belt or whether it was on one of the areas that we are actually, you know, putting high tech stuff, etc. Um, so I, I, I'm not really uh, convinced on that, that that hasn't come into the the um, decision making um, of this particular site and, you know, not having other sites. I think a number of people have mentioned it is a very high bar that is set for um, development in the green belts. And the more I think about it, the more I don't think it reaches the bar. Um, I, I think that to add uh, this sort of size building and the amount of hard area around it, the impact on the landscape there in the green belt next to already that huge car parking area. Um, there's a terrible cumulative effect as well um, on, on the green belt here, uh, which I think actually really can't be very acceptable. I, I think that there are genuine concerns about um, the safety aspects of it um, near that road, so near to the village, so near to that car park area, so near to that bridge. Uh, and we've been told that we can take those into consideration. And I think at the end of my thoughts, um, yes, it might be very nice for the police to have a nice new police station, but wanting something isn't always the same as actually needing it or absolutely needing it at this moment in time. We have got a local plan process that is is starting up now. We're in that and that new local plan is only 10 years away. And I really wonder whether we should be even considering something like this in the green belt as we have it now. And really, it should be something that should be actually being worked upon to be putting into the next local plan as a as a really appropriate site. I don't think it's an appropriate site. I think there are genuine reasons of um, crime that people um, have put forward and do stand up. But I think mainly it just does not reach the bar that is required. And I think more than ever now, we have to protect the countryside around us. You know, we are as a council saying this all the time to the public, how much it means to us, you know, protecting the countryside, protecting the, the rural nature of South Cairns. You know, we've got to stack up ourselves. Um, if we say these things, we have to mean them. Thank you very much, Chairman. Thank you. With Councillor Hawkins next, Chair. Yeah. Could I ask um, Stephen Reid, can you hear me? Can you turn off your video and audio, Stephen, please? Thank Sorry. You. That's fine. And sorry, we have next, sorry? It was Councillor Hawkins, Chairman. Yeah. Councillor Dr Toomey Hawkins, please. Uh, thank you, Chair. Uh, it certainly has been an interesting discussion um, so far today about this. And um, I mean, the, the main issue that we all keep coming back to is the fact that it's in the green belt and the, the harm that is being caused. Um, I mean, I've heard said that, you know, um, a site that's not in the green belt could or should have been found. But let's not forget, we were shown a list of 22 potential sites, uh, site options that were considered. And this was then boiled down to three sites which met the design criteria that uh, you know the police federation, whatever it is, have have set down for uh, new police stations. So it wasn't a finger in the air. Uh, you know we think this is okay. <laughs> this has been gone through, um, you know, quite seriously. And I hear what the um, uh, Cambridge past, present, and future have heard. You know the the arguments for you can find something somewhere else. But I think we need to bear in mind that there is, yes, there is a need. Yes, there are specs that have to be met. 
But also, yes, they have to cut their coat according to their size. So I actually am not in agreement with those who say, you know, the, 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 the land, you know, they shouldn't have thought about the price of the land. They should, because everyone has a budget. You cannot start building something without actually counting the cost. Um, so in my view, yes, um, you know, there was, or oh, I agree with what process has been gone through to get to the, uh, you know, the last three. Now, the last three, as it happens, are in the green belt. And in my view, this one that's been chosen is the list of the, I guess, you know, the least worst of them all. And whilst I accept that there is harm caused, the question is, do the benefits outweigh the harm? Uh, so in my mind, with and I'm asking the question, why is it being put here? So that's been answered. Why now? Because the current station is inadequate for policing into the next decade and more. We have to make sure that our police have the right facilities, just as we would want good facilities to work from. They need to have that too, so they can continue to protect us. The harm is there, no doubt about it. But they need a modern station within the design specs and able to provide uh, for the community that, that they serve. If they don't have that facility now, what do we expect? It's not going to be the sort of policing that we keep asking them for. So we need to bear that in mind. Um, I asked if we could have some sort of benchmarking, which has been agreed, and I think that should also come within into a condition. I'm not sure if uh, Mr. Carter has actually thought about that, because the fear of crime, um, you know, is something that the community is worried about. And, you know, rightly or wrongly, we've heard a lot about how that can be mitigated. And the benchmarking, the CCTV and the lighting is, you know, a, a, a set of mitigation measures, I think, um, could help with that. But also we've heard that there isn't um, the level of crime that, ex that people think exists where the current station is. So we've got to weigh this as well in that, yes, whilst there might be the fair, the question is, is it, uh, is that strong enough to say, no to providing our police service with the facilities they need working into the next decade or more. So considering everything that's been said, um, in my view, I think the benefits of this station outweigh the harm. It is close, yes. Uh, but thinking about the future, I think I will be uh, voting for, uh, for this. So thank you, Chair. But if we could make sure that the issue of the benchmarking is taken into account in the condition, please, Chair. Um, can we put that to Chris Carter at the moment? If um... Yes, thank you, Chair. Um, yeah, I did give this some consideration as well. Um, I think we can um, construct a condition to deal with that. Um, I have noted some wording down, which I'll, I'll just read out for you um, to see how members feel about that. So uh, prior to the first occupation of the uh, building, the applicant shall submit a report to demonstrate existing levels of crime reporting in the parish of Milton. Following this, further updated reports shall be submitted at six and 12 months following first use. Uh, if the data is found to show in an increase in reported events, uh, it should be accompanied by a strategy for this to be addressed, which shall then be implemented in the local community. Um, I, that, that's uh, slightly on the hoof, so um, it would be helpful if members did want to include that if you were to agree the precise wording to be delegated to the chair and vice chair um, or officers agreeing with the chair and vice chair should the uh, should the vote go that way. Thank you, chair. Thank you. Dr. Hogan, what do you think in terms of that? Does that address? Uh, yes, I would be happy with delegating the final words um, to the officers because they know what the intention is. But, but I think the, the timeline of six, 12 months, I wouldn't want that to be a hard limit so that there isn't any further monitoring going forward. 
So my point is, it shouldn't there shouldn't. I'm not sure that we want a hard limit of six to twelve months. What if it takes longer for that effect to come through? Is my point. Uh, I think uh, in order to for the condition to be to be reasonable, we would have to put some kind of of time limit on it. Um, it may be that uh, members consider a, a longer a longer interval um, would be more appropriate, and uh, be interested to hear what members think about that. But um, I think that could be flexed in that sense. Okay. Perhaps twelve to eighteen months. <laughs> oh, yeah. Okay. Thank you very much. Um, who do you have next to speak, Vice Chair? Um, we have two more councillors to speak. We also have a request from Mr. Reid if we can have a two minute adjournment before the vote. But as I say, we have two more councillors to make their comments before we get to that stage, Chair. Um, the first of those is Councillor Harvey. Thank you. Councillor Jeff Harvey. Yes, thank you, Chair. Um, that sort of two points, really. Um, I, I would be interested. Councillor Harvey, in... just, we just don't see you. That's. Um, there okay. go. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. Um, yes, I, I would actually appreciate um, uh, some explanation of the condition um, in regard to uh, the planning inspector. You know what what um, what that you know what what is expected to happen um, and, and why that condition is there. Uh, just as a sort of background thing, um, but just to talk more generally about the um, pros and cons of this. I, I mean, I think it's really really a very difficult one and um, partly that's because one's sort of trying to weigh things that are a sort of binary in nature um, you know for example um, is, is the protection of the green belt an absolute or you know um, and I suppose if you read um, the MPPF you, you might actually in a very sort of tight reading conclude that, um, that there is harm to the green belt and, and, it, and it's in, inappropriate but then one's trying to sort of weigh it against um, things that are, are harder to really quantify um, in a sort of binary way, which is sort of, um, you know, the, the, the need and, and the level of harm. I, and I agree with um, Peter Fain's point that you, you couldn't really say that this location is um, in some way um, destroying a, a sort of separation between the city and Milton because it's, it's kind of... Um, it's, it's off off to the west from from that situation. So I, I think that sort of strengthens the case. On the other hand, you know, it 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 is in the green belt, so that's a kind of a very serious thing. But I I think I would really agree with um, Councillor Hawkins that the, the problem is that I think we've been sort of um, shown some evidence here. You know, we 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 I think we have to sort of accept what we're told that. Um, the selection process was robust, so therefore we're in a, a situation where we have three sites that are all in the green belt, and I would very much concur that this one is the least worst in that sense. Um, so I, I'm sort of minded to vote for, but I mean, I am um, still, as I said earlier, I'm very disappointed that a public building should have such a low level of ambition in terms of sustainability, and it looks to me as though um, the sort of bream rating and, and the level of um, on-site renewables has just been set at the minimum that would be allowed and given that we've heard that it wasn't a sort of funding issue that uh, led to this site being selected um, and the fact that um, failing to provide those sort of uh, on-site regeneration uh, facilities would ultimately cost the service a lot of money um, and we could talk about this later, but I wonder if at the very least we could have a sort of advisory there that nothing in this application should preclude um, the provision later on of uh, more on-site uh, renewable generation and the provision of EV charging. So that's what I've got to say. Thank you, Councillor Harvey. And I think, you know, several, you know, quite a few people now are saying how difficult, you know, what we're hearing is how difficult it is to weigh this balance. Um, you have mentioned the made reference and I think we are now collecting any um, you know wanting to understand if the if it were to be approved if people were um, minded to approve this that there would be some conditions and you did mention the EV charging and I think the case officer did say that that could potentially be a condition so it it's now to say that if you would like to put something like that forward. 
Now's the time, Councillor Harvey. OK, well, um... shall we ask the case officer if you know what that condition would look like if it was about the EV charging within the, the, the car park? Yes, I think that would be very helpful. Thank you. Um, Chris or, or Lewis, do we have any support on that? I'll let Lewis deal with that one. <laughs> Thanks, Chris, for you, Chair. Um, if you just bear with me, I can draft the condition and share it with members in due course. OK. Um, do we have any? Thank you very much, Councillor Harvey. Thank you. Sorry, Chair. Yeah. Just, just to say, um, unless members wish to see the specific wording, I think, again, the EV charging is one where we could take that away and draft the precise wording following the meeting. Um, I think, um, you know, we, we've used similar conditions elsewhere, so that, that would be something members would be pretty familiar with anyway, I think. Yes, rather than sort of trying to draft it on screen, I think that's a, a better a better way. Um, thank you. And the, the next speaker? Final speaker chair is Councillor Heather Williams. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I agree with other members. This is the least worst option, which doesn't always fill you with the most optimism in them voting for it. Um, I, I think there has been a lot of work done. I do agree and looked at different sites um, and what and I think there is is need for the police to have alternative custody suites you know the any time that they're spent taking people out of area for example to Peterborough is, is time that they're not spending you know serving residents so I I do agree there is a need the issue I have is probably the same as others is the green belt issue and and we've we've explained how as much as you know we want to do everything we can to support our police forces we can't give them any special treatment um, and there is harm that that's and it's departure but I think when it and, and you probably can tell by the way I'm speaking that I'm really struggling with it like other members are it's whether there are very special circumstances for it to be where it is um, and I'm I'm not 100% convinced that there are very, very special circumstances that we would normally include in our criteria, although there is an, you know, we're human beings, there's going to be an inevitable emotional response um, that we want to ensure we do things right by the police and also the neighbours as well, because they have concerns which are valid. Um, I'm aware from previous issues with Park, Parkside Police Station, I think the the activity can quite often be a problem of the probation service, which is just behind, um, so just behind uh, Parkside Police Station as opposed to the station itself. Um, so that does give me some reassurance that the probation service isn't moving with them. But overall, I, I think it comes down to that planning planning balance of is this very special circumstances and I'm not sure the need to, to relocate qualifies as very special circumstances but yeah wrestling wrestling desperately here. Good and so thank you very much Councillor the Williams for, for that and I think we were hearing need we also have to talk about public benefit as well um, with that so um, I hear Stephen Reid, our legal advisor, is proposing that there's an adjournment. Stephen, are you proposing that that's before we look at what conditions would be before we go to the um, final vote? Or do can we move to any conditions first? Um, or Chris, you know, I would understand that we would vote on each of the conditions first um, rather than wrapping them up all in the one vote. Uh, I think you probably need Stephen to advise on his request there. Mm -hmm. uh, Chair, if I may, um, I, I would be relaxed about a um, uh, vote being taken on the conditions. I would just like to speak to you and to Mr Carter before the vote itself is taken. If you did ask me, my preference would be that actually um, 
uh, a two minute adjournment even before addressing conditions uh, would be more beneficial than than leaving it to just before the vote itself. OK, um, and vice chair, I, I don't think we have anybody else to speak. That's right, chair, no one else. No, and I, I really thank everybody. I think what, you know we're, we're all really weighing this up in in the balance, and we've had some good debate there, and all of the issues have come through. It would, in terms of if people were minded not to support this, um, I'm trying to note down, you know, what those reasons were. Now, what I'm hearing is that um, in general, it's not seeing that the public benefit outweighs the harms because of harm to um, Greenbelt openness and visual impact. Um, so it's the principle of development and the green belt and the fear of safety are those. Those are the reasons that I've heard if those who are minded not to um, approve. But if there's anything additional to that, please do let me know. Um, and meanwhile, we can have this adjournment. How should we do that, Chris, the adjournment? Chair, um, I've just sent a diary appointment to yourself and Stephen Reid, which contains a team's appointment to join. Uh, so you would leave this meeting and join that one momentarily. And so should, the, should we invite Vice Chair to attend as well, Chris? Yes. And if the meeting stays live. We just have ask everybody to have the video and audio off. Yes, we could ask uh, Liam just to put a slide up to say that we'll be um, we'll be uh, returning shortly. OK, Chair, so members, Chair, can, can, I, I, can I ask that you that we um, follow Stephen's advice and just to find out what, what this is about and have this two minute adjournment. Obviously, we'll come back and explain to you what that is. Chairman, could I just add a quick one? Um, cumulative effect, I think it is the cumulative effect as well of the building, the car park being so very in close proximity to the park and ride site. I don't know whether the officers think that that one would be um, appropriate, but it's one that I think is important. Thank you. In terms of our key material considerations, where yeah. where would you say that's in? We've got what would that be? Layout, scale, or highway safety? Um, scale, chairman. Mm -hmm. okay. um, as I say, I, I think because of the the, the the potential of the massing effect of it, and then all that concrete area of the uh, park and ride. I just think the the overall effect is going to be very, very bad. Chair, if I may, um, could I suggest um, possibly if we took a 15 minute adjournment, we'll deal with deal with Stephen Reid's query and it'll also give officers a chance to um, draft uh, a potential reason for refusal should the committee wish to go that way um, so that when we return, we can um, present that to the committee as well, if that'd be OK. Be really helpful. Yes, thank no, you. Very much. Yeah. Thank you, everybody. So if it's now, I've got 135. So if we come back at 150, um, Liam, thank you very much. You put up a slide and everybody take their video and audio off.
Are we live, Liam? Let me know when we're live. Hi, yeah, I'm just confirming now. Yeah, we're now live. Thank you. Thank you. Welcome back, everybody, to the South Cambridgeshire District Planning Committee. Um, and after a short adjournment, we're now coming back, having had the debate on this application and now moving forward towards the vote. We just had this short adjournment to look at the reasons for either approval or um, rejection, if people were minded either to approve or refuse this. And before we go any further, there have been some recommendations in terms of conditions if the committee was minded to approve. And so I'd just like now to go through um, those three proposed conditions one by one and see um, whether by affirmation or roll call those would be accepted if committee was minded to approve. Stephen. Uh, sorry, you're just going to take your roll call before doing that. Thank you very much. I've forgotten once again. Yes, thank you very much. So a roll call before we go to that, which would be very, very helpful. Councillor Henry Batchelor. Present. Councillor Dr Martin Kahn. Present. Present, but you won't be voting. Councillor Peter Fain. Present. Councillor Dr. Toomey Hawkins. Present. Councillor Judith Rippeth. Present. Councillor Deborah Roberts. Present Chairman. Councillor Heather Williams. Present. Councillor Dr. Richard Williams. Present. Thank you. Councillor Sue Ellington. Present. Councillor Jeff Harvey. Present. Thank you, everybody. Good. So Taking that, so as I said, we've had three proposed conditions um, if committee was minded to approve the application. Um, and I'd just like to take those one by one. If See, first of all, if we can do it by affirmation, and obviously this is affirmation if committee was minded to approve. Otherwise, we'll go by roll call. Um, the three conditions are, um, as had been proposed in terms of wording by um, Chris Carter, who, which one would be the CCTV on the A10 pedestrian bridge strategy. The second would be around a crime reporting strategy to have a benchmarking and to help with monitoring. And the third would be an EV strategy um, for the application in the car park. So I'll take the first one, which is around the CCTV A10 pedestrian bridge strategy. Who would like to propose that? to propose the chair i'm happy to thank you and who'd like to second that can i second yep okay can i take that by affirmation agreed agreed agreed, agreed. thank you everybody anybody against abstain good okay so that condition if minded to approve that would be accepted the second one is around a crime reporting strategy it would help with benchmarking and monitoring and assessment. Um, anybody who would like to propose that? Yes, please. Councillor Hawkins. Councillor Dr. Toomey Hawkins, who would like to second that? Happy to second. Councillor yep. Rippeth. Judith Rippeth, thank you. And committee, can we take that by affirmation? Agreed. 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 Anybody against? Or abstaining? OK, thank you. And the third one, which is the EV strategy um, for the car park, who would like to propose that motion for a condition? I, I would like to propose that. Councillor uh, Jeff Harvey? Uh, yes. Who would like to second uh, it? Happy to second. Hawkins. Thank you, Councillor Toomey Hawkins. Um, committee, can that be by affirmation? Agreed. 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 Okay. Thank you very much. And now we come to the vote and members that's on page 38, which is the recommendation. Um, and we've had a thank you very much, everybody. I think a, a really good and serious debate where this has challenged everybody um, to look at weighing the, the balance between the public benefit and the um, harm to the, the green belt. So thank you all for that. The recommendation here is to approve the proposal subject to a consultation with and confirmation from the Secretary of State that the application is not to be called in for his determination and b the planning conditions are set below in the report and as just voted upon um, and 
I know that there'll be differences in, um, I think, in, in voting as from what we've heard from people during the debate. So if that's OK, I will go accord. Chris, you Sorry, Chair. Sorry to intervene. Um, would you like me to, um, for those members who may wish to vote for refusal, um, uh, which I think there may be some, would you like me to put up on, on screen yes. the proposed wording that we've arrived at? Yes, please. I'll just do that now. Would you like me to read it out or is it OK to read? I think you should read it out. It's quite small. Okay. Yeah. So the applicants have failed to demonstrate very special circumstances to outweigh the harm that would arise from the proposal to the green belt by reason of its inappropriateness. The harm, both individually and cumulatively with nearby development, would be significant, representing a form of development which would fail to assist in the safeguarding of the countryside from encroachment and fail to preserve the setting and special character of Cambridge and Milton. The benefits arising from the, from the scheme would not outweigh harm to the Greenbelt or harm in terms of impacts to the landscape and from the loss of agricultural land. The proposal is therefore contrary to the South Cambridgeshire Local Plan 2018, policies HQ1, S4, S7, NH2, NH3 and NH8 and paragraphs 143 and 144 of the NPPF National Planning Policy Framework 2019. Thank you. Um, and members, is, is that OK in terms of capturing your your reasons for refusal, if you are minded to refuse? Yeah, very much so, Chairman. Thank you. Thank you. Good. Councillor Harvey would like to speak, Chair. Councillor Jeff Harvey. Yeah, yes, uh, Chair, I, I just wanted, could we take it then that the EV strategy, which uh, will be prepared later, will uh, touch upon the on-site renewable uh, as part of that? No, not as not as worded. OK, um, Chair, we weren't if, given the wording, but. If, if I may, um, I, I know Councillor Harvey suggested possibly an informative with regard to wider uh, sustainability measures uh, to be included. I think that would be um, appropriate. I think um, a strategy for the electric vehicle charging points um, we can include as condition, but I'd suggest perhaps an informative uh, along the lines that Councillor Harvey suggested to advise the applicant that they, they shouldn't uh, shy away from any further additional sustainability measures in the future if committee were agreeable to that. Councillor Harvey, is that, does that address your? Yes, I think it would. I was just concerned that um, a potentially useful um, uh, avenue w was left unexplored, if you like. So, so yep. thank you very much. No, and we've done that in in informatives um, in the past on other applications, so I think that's fine. So, um, committee, if minded to approve, um, by affirmation, would you approve of that informative also to be included? Agreed. Agreed. Okay. Thank you very much. Thank you for that, Councillor Harvey. Thank you, Chair. OK, um, so members, I will now go to this. So the recommendation is to approve the proposal subject to a consultation with and confirmation from the Secretary of State that the application is not to be called in for his determination and b the informative and planning conditions are set out below and as um, voted on just now by committee, those three additional conditions. Um, please, in the roll call, answer for, against or abstain as I call out your names and I will try and insert in the subs in alphabetical order as well um, within the roll call. So I'll start. Councillor Henry Batchelor. For, Chair. Councillor Dr Martin Kahn. Not voting, voting, Chair. Oh, sorry. Uh, here I go, badly. Sorry. Um, Councillor Sue Ellington. Against. Councillor Peter Fain. For. Councillor Jeff Harvey. For. Councillor Dr Toomey Hawkins. For. Councillor Judith Rippeth. For. Councillor Deborah Roberts. Against. Councillor Heather Williams. Against. Councillor Dr Richard Williams. Against. And my vote would be for.
that would be six in favour and four against and no abstentions. Um, so the application um, is approved. Thank you, everybody. If we now turn to our agenda and we are on to agenda item six, the enforcement report. And who do we have to take us through that, please? That will be me. <laughs> <laughs> How did you appear magically like that? <laughs> Wonderful. Thank you I very much. Had a little elf tap me on the shoulder. <laughs> Thank you, Alistair. Do you want to take us through the enforcement report? If there's anything to special uh, to, to make us note in the report? There's there's no update to the report. Um, um, it is as it is. If there's any questions, I'll do my best to answer. Um, members, do you have any questions for Alistair? No one's indicated, Chair. OK, so nothing on that one. Thank you very much, um, Alistair. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah. And agenda item seven, which are um, appeals against planning decisions and a report on that recent appeals. Chair, um, no particular updates. Uh, we spoke about the appeal decision, which is noted on page 57 uh, land to the east of Cody Road and north of Bannell Road at the last meeting. So I won't repeat that um, here, but uh, otherwise the other two appeals were, were both dismissed, which is good news. Happy to take any questions. Any questions, members? Please, Chair. Councillor Rippeth, Chair. Councillor Judith Rippeth. Um, apologies if this has been repeated because I wasn't present at the previous meeting. Um, Chris Carter, through you, Chair, could you um, give any more information on the allowed with costs and what the reasons for that were on the Bannock Road application? Uh, you're testing me now, Councillor Riffith. So I'd rehearsed this for the previous meeting and not for this one, but uh, <laughs> um, would, would you be happy to receive uh, a summary after the meeting um, just so yeah, I can refresh uh, myself on the appeal decision? If everybody else has heard it, yeah, that's fine. Thank you. Good. Thank you. And there's a, one more question for myself, Chair, if that's OK. Oh, sorry. Yes, Councillor Bachelor. Yeah, it's on the informal hearings section. Um, I note the uh, the uh, hearing for 100 Houses Society is listed um, as being appealed because of non-determination is actually appealed against refusal granted by this committee. So just to just want to correct an inaccuracy in the, uh, in the papers there. Thank you, Councillor Bachelor. That's that's noted. Thank you. Good. And thank you. Anything else, Councillor Vice Chair? No one else, Chair. OK. And as I understand, the next planning committee meeting is on Tuesday, 13th of April. Is that right, Patrick? That sounds right, Chairman. Sorry, I haven't got. That's right. I think I've got it in my notes here, so that would be that would be good. Thank you. So thank you, everybody, for your time today um, and for all of the contributions. That was a, a difficult balance that was struck today. I now declare the meeting closed um, and thank members of the public as well for viewing the stream leaning, stream, streaming of this meeting. Thank you, everybody. Bye.